Hey everyone, uh, can you see my screen? Great. Uh, my name is Jamil Cream. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Hiki. Really excited to to be here with you all today. Let's uh, let's go ahead and, and dive right in. So this might come as a surprise to to most folks, but uh, loneliness is actually one of the leading causes of death in the world. Uh, those of us who are lonely or socially isolated are 10 times more likely to die early than those of us who have strong relationships. And almost eight out of 10 autistic adults report feeling lonely or socially isolated. This last statistic I actually removed from the deck at the last moment. I wanted to be mindful should it be triggering for anyone. So I apologize in advance, but autistic adults between the ages of 18 and 33 are 15 times more likely to commit suicide than their neurotypical counterparts. And so a couple of years ago, when my cousin who has autism reached out to me um, and he confided in me that he was feeling really lonely and he was finding it difficult to make friends. And ultimately he was really terrified that he wouldn't have a partner of his own one day. Um, I got really, really nervous. And so when I, when I share this, this public health crisis with people, I think that the typical question that I get asked is, well, does autism cause you um, to be predisposed to these feelings of loneliness and depression and social isolation. And all of the academic and the medical research is conclusive. The neurology of autism has absolutely nothing to do with feeling lonely or feeling isolated. It has everything to do with a fundamental lack of infrastructure and resources that have been developed for this community. And so as scary as these numbers are, um, there's a silver lining there because this is an incredibly solvable issue which is why we decided to build Hiki. Hiki, meaning able in Hawaiian, is the first ever friendship and dating social platform specifically for the neurodivergent community. I think well-intentioned people create apps. We, we certainly know policymakers draft policy for underserved communities, but they actually remove those communities from the process. And so when building Hiki, it was tremendously important that we didn't do that. Every part of the app was built, not just for the community, but by the community. So everything from the size of the buttons that we had to get special permission from the Apple store to use to the colors that sit next to each other, which were, which were chosen by a PhD in sensory processing disorders, to the notifications, to the onboarding flow, to the questions within the profile is all specifically for the neurodivergent community. It's a safe atmosphere. It's a place where being atypical is celebrated and you can be yourself without any sort of fear of exclusion. And this last point, it, it's an obvious one because it's a mobile app, but a lot of the, the places that neurotypicals have become accustomed to, um, well, accustomed to back in the day, uh, bars and restaurants and things of that nature are incredibly triggering from a sensory processing, for, pro, sensory processing perspective. So autistic adults, even in advance of Hiki existing, have largely lived their lives online within the digital space. So how big is this opportunity? The total addressable market today is 40 million high-functioning autistic adults between the ages of 18 and 55, and that number is likely grossly underestimated by a magnitude of anywhere between 2 to 3x. What is our go-to-market strategy? Um, our go-to-market strategy is, is, is relatively simple but incredibly efficient. In advance of building Hiki, in advance of writing a single line of code, we reached out to a number of the largest nonprofits and organizations within the space that are serving the neurodivergent community in a variety of other ways to get a deeper understanding of exactly what kind of product we can build to enable autistic adults to lead more fulfilling lives. And so once we created Hiki, they were so incredibly thrilled and grateful that it exists that they've given us direct access to their communities through everything from the form of um, email campaigns to newsletters to social media posts to even just sharing their actual emails with us directly. So how have we executed on that go-to-market strategy? We launched our MVP in July of 2019, so we're almost one year old. Um, we already have well over 6,000 monthly active users on the app across all age groups and geographies, over 20,000 connections made, over 20,000 public community posts, almost 9,000 private chats initiated, and our average user spends 12 minutes per day on the app. Since January 1st, we've grown by over 100%. And to just give you some context over what, it, what a public community post is and what a private chat is, there are really currently two main verticals within the app. Vertical A is your traditional dating app. You can swipe right, you can swipe left. Hiki is a little unique since it's a friendship and a dating platform. 
you can click a smiley face button, which means you're interested in being friends with someone. You can click a heart, which means you're interested in being more. And then there's a community social media aspect of Yap, which operates very much like an Instagram wall or a Facebook newsfeed, where any member of the community, regardless of whether you have matched one-on-one, -on -one, can make a public post and the rest of the community can engage with that post. So we are obviously um, a mission-driven organization, and that is a part of our ethos and our DNA, but we are not a nonprofit. We have every intention of building a big, sustainable, economically viable business and leveraging some of um, the monetization path of the neurotypical competitors within the space, Tinder, Hinge, and Bumble, we've launched as a completely free service and we'll introduce a premium level paid subscription service, which will have additional features at the same time limiting some of the features that users have become accustomed to. And if we leverage some pretty conservative assumptions of conversion rates, which we pull directly from Tinder and an average monthly subscription fee, which is the marketplace average, you get to some very compelling economics very quickly. Again, our current customer acquisition cost is zero dollars. We haven't spent a single dollar on marketing. All of our growth is organic. Our premium subscription comes out to about $240 per annum per customer. When you layer on some of those ga gamification pay-per-use features, you get to an additional $144 per annum per customer, which comes out to $384 per annual premium customer. And you can see in just some, some very conservative growth numbers, the numbers grow quite, quite fast. So, this to me is um, by far the, the most important and, and compelling slide in the deck. These are our testimonials directly from our users. Um, I'm not gonna read all of them, but, but I'll share just a, a couple. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for creating this app. As a person on the autism spectrum and an active member of the disability community, I cannot begin to explain how invaluable this is. Uh, I'm older and I never thought I would be the person on a dating app, but here I am enjoying every minute and grateful for the chance to meet a friend or maybe more. This is our team. Uh, my background, uh, the first half of my career, I spent in financial services, investment banking at JP Morgan, private equity at Blackstone, and then most recently, uh, heading up the real estate teams at co-living startups like Bungalow. Amira Artis, who is a co-founder and CMO, uh, Princeton undergrad, MBA from Harvard, really truly like a marketing guru. And then Boon Chu, who's got some of the fastest hands I've ever seen, um, is a full stack dev previously at Amazon and Microsoft. These are our in incredible advisors. Our Fridge Vigo is an autistic self-advocate. She's the founder of Actually Autistic, which is a global support group for adults on the spectrum. Dr. Emily Rothman, who is one of the world's most foremost experts on everything that has to do with sex and the autism spectrum. And then Miranda Clark, our general counsel. Currently, we're raising $300,000, which gets us to 20 months of runway, and we're about a third of the way there. And that's it. I'll play this in the background, but um, we can we can definitely dive into the question. Should should that be uh, helpful? Okay, great. We have about a minute for questions. So if you have a question, feel free to click one of the little icons so it pops up next to your name. Uh, Valentina? Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I guess my question is more about how do you think this app, I guess, differentiates from other social medias? I know you mentioned like it's direct competitors with like Hinge, Bumble. Like, is it just because of the community? And if so, do you see any future com kind of like competition with also other media platforms like Facebook, they might be able to just create like a Facebook group and then it will be kind of a similar idea that you have this community for people to meet. Yeah, so to, to clarify, I apologize. We don't view Hinge, Tinder, Bumbler or any app serving the neurotypical co community as competitors. We leverage those them as, as comps to think about the way that we think about like conversions and, and economic impact but we definitely do not see them as competitors because they're not serving the neurodivergent community. Um, research shows that autistic adults would prefer to meet other autistic adults. And they also, so they're not being served by the current apps which exist within this space. But I think that, that the root of your question is like, where does this go beyond specifically dating and social media? Um, there are a number of things that once you own the community or you have access to a number of autistic adults which you can layer onto the platform, we're currently layering on um, employment. So we are uh, one of the, the largest um, referral systems 
for uh, companies that are seeking neurodivergent talent, which is really important right now. So if you're, you're looking to hire autistic talent and you don't know where to go, um, they come and they come to Hiki and then we get, we clip a referral fee. So there's a number of things that you layer on to this social media aspect. We use dating and we use uh, companionship and we use community as a means to create a platform to attract people to come to us. And then we've, and then we've laid on a number of other things from like a revenue generating perspective. Yeah, thank you. I, mean, I think it's a really meaningful app and I'm so happy you guys are doing this. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, that's all the time for Hiki. Um, thank you. Next we have Kara Water. Hi guys, can everyone hear me? Oh, all right, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Awesome, cool. I just want to, you know, just say uh, for Hickey, that's a very commendable mission and that's, I think it's really awesome you guys are doing that. So all right, I'll go ahead and get started. Hi, my name is Cody Sardine. I'm the CEO of Clara Water. Clara Water manifests pure drinking water from, the, from thin air and has been recognized as a top 50 technology to change the world by the SDG Impact Awards. By investing in us, you'll catapult the last mile of drinking water and reduce waste. Today, over half the countries in the world experience water scarcity. And due to COVID-19, these populations are suffering even more. In India, 21 major cities will run out of drinking water this year. Everyone, both rich and poor, are affected by this. Lack of access to drinking water has led to increased health care costs, high drinking water costs, and excess waste. In India, building water infrastructure is projected to be over $270 billion. That's a lot of money. A single-use plastic bottle releases too much CO2. Let me put this in perspective. One case of bottled water produces the equivalent CO2 footprint of driving your car 10 miles. There were 960 billion cases of bottled water consumed in 2018. Our solution to this is called Car Pure, an exceptional drinking water dispenser which creates pure drinking water from the humidity in the air. It requires no water line. All the customer needs to do is plug it in. Car Pure produces up to 11 liters of water per day. The average family of four drinks 9.5 liters of water per day. Our desiccant technology, which is like the silicone packets that you find in your shoebox, is a very attractive feature to our distributors. One of our four distributors actually chose Car Pure over our competitors because of its sleek design. It runs near silence, and it has a very attractive price point. Car has a triple bottom line goal, social, economic, and environmental impact. In three years, we'll produce 320 million liters of clean drinking water in water scarce areas. We'll offset 640 million plastic water bottles, 90% of which would have ended up in landfills or our oceans, and generate $125 million in revenue. Our vision is to become the number one source of drinking water around the world. The global air to water market is priced at around $3.7 billion. There are 162,000 extended stay hotels in Asia alone, representing $121 million in sales. We employ a wholesale distribution model, which allows for rapid scaling. Our distributors plan to sell to hotels, hospitals, and real estate developers in countries where drinking water is scarce. We plan to deliver 10 fully paid demo units to three distributors by July 2020 and we project 300 unit sales in the fourth quarter of 2020. Our distributors bring a high caliber to the table. For instance, our project APAC consists of five executives and the CEO is a 20 year telecom equipment, equipment industry ex executive and has a proven track record. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. We're in a post COVID-19 world and car pure adds so much value where drinking water is gonna be so necessary. So we produce car pure for $464 per unit and we sell it to our distributors for $750. Increased volume will enable us to reach 50% gross margins. Our revenue in February was $6,000. Car Water is ready to enter our next phase of growth. We are raising 250 k on a rolling convertible note, and we raised $20,000 to date. And we also recently won Columbia's Urban Works Challenge India with a prize of $20,000 as well. Funds will provide a five month runway and allow us to do a full equity raise of $1 million in the fall of this year. The 250K will be used to conduct pilots in the APAC region and fulfill sales. So there's a lot of competition in the drinking water space. 
in reverse osmosis, it can waste up to 90% of input tap water, which is really counterproductive in regions where water contamination is really high. Other small-scale air water units use refrigerants, which will be banned in India starting in 2023. And U.S. water dispenser customers have an average lifetime of 11 years, confirming that our customers will be very, will be very sticky. Colorado Water has built a very strong team. Our head of sales has sold over $700,000 of drinking water products. Our CTO, he founded and exited a desiccant HVAC startup. Our CFO is an experienced entrepreneur and raised $200 million for a startup hedge fund. Our CEO, myself, I've launched an international architectural consulting firm, which has become the model for globalization for my previous firm. The world is facing a drinking water crisis. Colorado Water is ready for launch, low energy use, and a low cost solution. We can alleviate this crisis in Indian cities and around the world. Colorado Water is looking for investors to meet our strong sales demands and to, for introductions to new distributors. Invest with us and make pure drinking water in a brand new way. Thank you. Great, thank you, Cody. Um, who has questions? Uh, Jacob. Hi, hi, Cody, great presentation. Uh, quick question, can you tell us a little bit more about the IP behind this product? For instance, do you guys own the IP? Sure, absolutely. So we have uh, two patents for provisionals. We have a design patent and we have a IoT patent that we're pro uh, producing for um, a system that will decrease energy while increasing efficiency of water production. We're also having an exclusive license on one of our core technologies as well. Sorry, can you, can, can you elaborate on the exclusive license part? Sure, so one of the core technologies is um, coming from one of our suppliers and it helps us produce the water in a certain way. And that core technology, there's only four or five suppliers in practically the whole world that make it and we have, are working on, we have an exclusive with them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Cassie. How does your company differentiate yourself from Agua Clara? It's Agua Clara, Agua Clara, okay, so Agua Clara uses refrigerants. So other atmospheric water generators, which is the AWG industry that we're in, use refrigerants, which are like these things that are in your refrigerator or your conditioning air conditioner. Refrigerants are ozone depleting, and due to the Paris Accord, almost every country in the world is going to phase out refrigerants. So essentially in a few years, our competition is going to be wiped out, which is fantastic for us. Great, and then a question from Cindy. Could you talk about your unit economics? Sure, um, so our unit economics, we're currently producing a stainless steel version, which is the exceptional design that we wanted to stick to. We believe that when it comes to consumer market, it's not just about functionality, it's about the design, how you feel with it, how it makes you feel in your own home, if it fits into your home or the location that you're putting it. Um, so our unit economics is 464 right now. We're planning to decrease that as we move into plastics as well. And that's going to decrease our unit economics, I'm sorry, our uh, cost of goods sold by nearly 50%. That will significantly increase our margins as we continue to gain traction with our distributors. And we'll also pass those savings on to our distributors to allow them to increase in sales and volume. Okay, great. Um, that's all the questions we have for now. So thank you so much, Cody um, and Kara Water. Awesome, thanks guys. Next we have Icarus. Hi, everybody. Give me one sec. And which screen are you seeing right now? Are you seeing my full screen? Can you hear me? No, no screen yet. No full, no screen? Nope. Hmm. Let me uh, close out. I Screen one, sure. Can you see my full screen now? Yeah, that looks great. Okay, great. Hi everybody, I'm Mark Anderson. I'm the founder and CEO of Icarus RT Incorporated. Icarus is a hybrid solar thermal and PV technology that can, um, cools photovoltaic panels, collects and extracts the heat from the panels, 
and uses that heat later on to generate power using organic ranking cycle. So um, we've been around about three and a half years now. Uh, we've won a number of awards I'll tell you about. Uh, we've raised quite a bit of funding and uh, we have two patents pending. <clears throat> the problem is, you know, solar energy is terrific. They're installing about 500,000 sol uh, solar panels per day right now. However, um, it's not very efficient. In fact, it's only about 20% effective at converting the sun's energy into electric power um, per solar panel. And unfortunately, the sun's uh, energy is not necessarily reaching uh, a particular area at the time where the demand is even needed, much less um, the greatest. Here in Southern California, for example, our peak demand begins around 4 p.m. just when the solar um, uh, is beginning to you know, end for the day and uh, the peak demand goes on until about 9 p.m. In addition to that, as panels heat up every day, which of course they heat up, um, their performance drops even further. So it'll go down from about that 20% I mentioned earlier to an output of around 16% every day because of the temperature uh, that the panels reach. So Icarus first started out as a uh, design to cool solar panels. And we're effective at that. By cooling the panels, our system will increase output about 9% of every panel um, that we apply our heat extractor to. Um, but that's only half the story. The, the amount of heat that we collect and we extract and collect and store that can be used after hours is much more valuable because of that peak demand and the time of day that we're able to sell the electricity that we store. The big difference is, and this is an important point, while we're charging our thermal battery all day long, we're cooling the panels and improving the output, a traditional battery consumes the PV output all day to charge that traditional battery. So they consume the output, we improve the output, okay? Let's see here, I change screens. Um, of course we have competition, but the market is massive. In fact, our SOM is about $200 million just here in the US alone. I literally mean 500,000 solar panels are being installed every day. Our um, particular market is commercial and industrial scale. And that's about 60% of those 500,000 panels or 300,000 panels per day. Our beachhead markets are places like hospitals, um, industrial buildings that are using uh, hot water as well as PV because we have a byproduct of hot water that we can give them to reduce reliance on natural gas. In fact, we have a letter of intent from Kaiser Permanente to test our system. Uh, ultimately, though, our true market, um, our, you know, our beachhead market is here in this industrial buildings. Our, our ultimate market is utility scale, the big plants out in the desert. And along the way, we view EV charging over the next 10 years as being a new demand on the grid that is not currently being met. And that new power will have to come from somewhere, and Icarus could help to solve that problem. We are in the Shell Game Changer program right now. We won it for 2020, and we're working with NREL as a result for the next 18 months to help us come up with solutions that Shell will be interested in. I don't know why it keeps doing that to me, I'm sorry. We've got a terrific team that we've built. Sort of my partner there, Ron Pitt, is the CTO. Ron is the former, um, president and CTO of a company called Trace Engineering. And at that time, Trace was the largest producer of solar inverters in the world. It was quite a while ago, but he's been an entrepreneur in the industry since. Jay Franklin is an entrepreneur in the solar industry or the power industry as well. And he's taken his company from about $2 million to $20 million in the last six or seven years. Gary uh, Everecklian has been in the water industry his entire career and very into clean tech, um, very well connected here in Southern California. Uh, and he's our 
VP of Business Development. We've got a team of about eight full-time now and eight more part-time for the summer, um, plus a terrific advisory board with hundreds of years of experience uh, in the industry and in entrepreneurship. We've got tremendous momentum and traction, letters of support from companies like Solar Turbines, Kaiser Permanente. We won the uh, CalSeed Award in 2019, SolidWorks 2019 Entrepreneurs Program, and the 2020 Berkeley Haas um, C2M Program, Clean Team Protect to Market, which already began as far as uh, selecting the team, but the, the true program doesn't begin until mid-August. So we've got the path to commercialization identified this year, this summer, COVID schmovid, we are installing um, a, a, a final prototype, proof of concept prototype. We've already done several proofs of, proofs of concept. This one is at uh, UCSD at an off-campus facility that's currently locked, but as soon as uh, we're able to get back in that facility, we'll be running our prototype doing final tests before we go out to the desert at the Imperial Valley Proof of Concept Center with a full scale 25 kilowatt system um, this fall. We've already got uh, funding for both of those systems. By the way, the second one will be grid tied and SDSU will be an off taker on that. Um, so those are all beyond planned, they're ready to go. We hope to do uh, uh, installation with Kaiser or the city of Pasadena or the city of Chula Vista here in so Southern California in the first quarter of next year. And we have letters of interest from all of them. So in summary, Icarus is a transformational technology. Um, it is ready to go. It'll have a huge impact on the world of energy uh, and the environment. Um, it, the, we're, we're in two markets that are growing just massively, the PV industry and the storage industry, and they're going to be propelled further very soon by the EV charging market. Um, we've raised about 800, well, we, we've won or ways, raised about $800,000 so far. We've got a runway, oh, about four or five months, but we have means to increase that runway. And that does, that's already paying for those projects I told you about. This is a doable plan with a great team and we're working with NREL. Um, we're just in a great position at this point. So if anybody has any questions, I'd love to answer them. Not all at once though. <laughs> Okay, thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, wait, uh, sorry, Mark, we have one question from Jacob. Uh, oh. Thoughts on your um, international opportunities? Well, there, um, so I'm not sure how much you know about uh, energy and power, but let me try to put it in perspective. Um, there is a solar power plant outside of Las Vegas called Ivanpah. That's a 300 megawatt plant. Uh, it's about five years old. At the time it was installed, it was um, the biggest of its kind in the world. China has two one and a half gigawatt plants, which both are more than five times as big as that solar thermal plant in Ivanpah. Um, India has one that big as well. And on the, in the pipeline, not only do those two countries, but others have well over one gigawatt single PV plants planned for um, the next several years. It's just a, a tremendous international market. Here we are in Southern California, the, uh, just a terrific place to uh, develop our technology but launch it for the rest of the world. Great, and then 
One question from Jean, how much are you planning to raise and for what purpose right now? Oh, great. So I mentioned our runway a little earlier. We feel that another $600,000 will get us past the installations that we plan in the first quarter of next year and into the manufacturing process. That'll include underwriter uh, laboratory certification. It'll include uh, you know complete set of manufacturing drawings and specifications to begin specking out um, uh, you know our OEM materials and um, prepare us for a seed round, which would be about two million dollars in the middle of next year for a real launch. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark. You're welcome. And Thank we you have, for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for being here. Next, we have Resilient Biotics. Stop, stop share. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Belknap. I'm CEO of Resilient Biotics. And what we do is develop a uh, microbiome derived therapeutics to address respiratory infectious disease in, uh, in animals for animal health. And we're, we're doing this to address uh, a huge critical need uh, within animal health and it's very much related to human health, which is the reduction of uh, dangerous pathogens and namely antibiotic resistant microorganisms, which have uh, become very prominent due to the overuse of antibiotics in, in the livestock industry uh, across the globe. Um, these are not only dangerous to our food supply, but also represent a huge threat to human health. And then secondly, zoonotic diseases, which are also a massive threat to, to human health and something we're experiencing right now in, uh, in the COVID pandemic, but that's not the first and it's not going to be the last of these types of diseases which begin in animals and transfer to humans. So ultimately what we're trying to do is provide, provide new solutions to address uh, these critical problems that, that originate in, uh, in animals. And so what we do is identify microbiome strains that can be developed as uh, therapeutics for disease prevention. And we know this is possible from a large body of scientific literature that indicates that the microbiome is very important for defense against these types of pathogens. And therefore we can go in and identify specific microbiome strains to develop as alternatives to antibiotics and as a better option for routine use and as a method to control the spread of these zoonotic diseases. In order to do this, uh, Resilient Biotics has developed our own in-house discovery platform that begins with intensive data analytics using high resolution genomics paired with our uh, in-house developed machine learning uh, programs to target specific microbial strains that are predicted to have uh, therapeutic benefits to a host. And once we've identified those strains, we then isolate them and continue to work with them in the lab where we've set up a suite of uh, in vitro validation assays that allow us to uh, test for specific mechanism of action of a microbial strain and also mix uh, groups of strains together and look for the most optimal formulation of a, uh, a microbiome therapeutic. So our lead program is bovine respiratory disease and this is a, uh, a massive problem for the cattle industry. It leads to about three billion uh, dollars uh, a year in annual loss, uh, I'm sorry, in, in annual losses to, uh, to both the beef and dairy industry in North America. The, the, the infection is a, a complex uh, a respiratory infection where uh, antibiotics are heavily used to, to treat it and control it. And there are, are, uh, there's a real lack of, of other uh, preventative approaches. So, so the entire industry is really asking for, for new preventative approaches for, for bovine respiratory disease. So we directed our discovery platform to, uh, to, to respiratory tract systems, and in particular, the respiratory tract of cattle to understand the microbiome and how it interacts with the host. And we've identified a set of microorganisms that uh, have been formulated into a therapeutic mixture, and they uh, really make up uh, several different modalities of function. The first is ecological competition, where they're out competing uh, pathogens for niche uh, space. 
The second is direct uh, pathogen inhibition, where they, where they stop growth of pathogens. And then the third is stimulation of a, a beneficial host immune response. And so we've selected our microorganisms based on these criteria to come up with the most efficacious formulation for these BRD uh, pathogens. And, uh, and so we, we've designed this mixture. We're, we're delivering it intranasally. So this is not a, a common probiotic. This is actually a, a therapeutic that you can think of like a vaccine, uh, except it's a mix of live microorganisms. And we have a, uh, uh, an IP protected uh, uh, consortium. We have tested our lead formulation for bovine respiratory disease in a, uh, an animal uh, challenge model. Uh, we've seen fantastic results where uh, animals treated with our product uh, experience reduced viral and bacterial clinical symptoms of bovine respiratory disease. And we also looked at uh, our main uh, clinical endpoint, which is the, uh, the occurrence of lung lesions. And we saw a 60% reduction in lung lesions in animals uh, treated with our product. So really indicating that the, the, the treatment is preventing these pathogens from getting into the lung and causing substantial damage in the lungs of the cattle. And then in addition to that, we've also been able to quantify less pathogen load and better uh, daily gain in the animals as well. So they've been more productive overall. So uh, really across the board, the animals have done better with our product in these uh, challenge study models. We're focused on not only bovine respiratory disease, but building out a robust product pipeline using our discovery platform to focus on uh, respiratory disease indications uh, in other areas of animal health. Uh, so for our lead program, we've, we've uh, finished validation studies and uh, in our next round of funding, we continue to we plan to continue to move that product forward through manufacturing development into the regulatory phase and also work, start working with a, uh, a commercialization partner to get that product to market. Uh, we've also begun work on a uh, similar type of product for a uh, swine respiratory application, uh, and that is in uh, early discovery phase right now. And then we have plans in place for uh, 2021 to continue work on a, a third product for respiratory health in, in, uh, in, in animals. And then in addition to our internal products uh, developed for uh, respiratory health, we've also uh, been able to establish uh, collaboration with an external uh, large animal health company to look at uh, a completely different disease target that's also, uh, it's, it's a disease that's, that's treated heavily with antibiotics and uh, everyone wants to get away from that approach. And so they have uh, partnered with us to do uh, discovery work on the microbiome and identify new potential therapeutics we can use there. In addition to the, the huge need for, for new types of preventative products in animal health, they also represent uh, huge market opportunities uh, within this industry. So both bovine respiratory disease and porcine respiratory disease are uh, about a billion and a half uh, annual uh, treatment markets globally. Uh, and so successful products in this space are typically 100 to 200 million dollar uh, per year products. And those are absolute blockbusters in animal health. So, so that's the space we're playing in and, and we anticipate uh, that, that type of success. And finally, just uh, wanted to, to provide a brief introduction to the team. We have a, a great uh, set of people driving our research program forward and our animal testing program forward. Uh, I come from a, a microbiology background. I've done intensive research on microbiome systems and I've developed uh, microbial products uh, for, for agricultural applications. My co-founder, uh, Greg Warner, is also our CTO and he has a, a great background in bioinformatics artificial intelligence and data science and has worked in a number of different uh, capacities doing drug discovery, uh, synthetic biology, and uh, human genomic uh, research. And finally, uh, our chief operating officer, Rochelle Galvin, comes from an animal health and pharmacology background, and she is driving forward our R&D strategy and animal uh, testing strategy. So uh, we are currently raising uh, a round of Series A funds to continue development of our therapeutic products and push them through to the next phases. I'd be happy to speak with anyone who, uh, who wants to find out more details on that. And then I'll, uh, I'll pause for questions. Thanks a lot.
Thanks, Chris. We can give everyone a moment to type their questions if they have any. Uh, Jean says, can you tell us more about your competition? What do you consider as your main competitive advantage? The, the products that we intend to replace are currently the status quo treatment. So antibiotics, uh, especially uh, metaphylactic dosing of antibiotics, which is preventatively, preventatively using antibiotics for, for treatment of these types of diseases. Uh, everyone in the industry, veterinarians, owners, managers of uh, large uh, feedlots or dairy uh, companies, they, they want to stop doing that. They recognize that approach is not sustainable. And so they look at a product like ours and, and they're very uh, excited and optimistic that something that like we're developing might come in and replace those antibiotics. Um, there are uh, other types of microbial products out there in, in animal nutrition, but it's really in the nutritional space. It's meant to uh, aid uh, feed conversion, whereas our products are therapeutic products. Okay, great. Roxy says, can you explain what FDA regulations you have to deal with? Uh, in, in, uh, in, in all likelihood, 90% likelihood, we will be regulated by the USDA uh, for animal health, which uh, oversees biologics for animal health, and that includes uh, vaccines um, and, uh, and other types of non-small molecule uh, products. And, and so uh, the, the USDA has a, a pretty uh, standardized three-year process for approval, and uh, the, the studies are, are pretty straightforward. Okay, thank you. That's all the time we have for Resilient Biotics. Um, there is one more question in the chat if you want to go ahead and answer that as well. Um, thank you so much, Great, Chris. Next, we have Positive Energy. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, can everybody hear and see me? Yes. All right, first, obstacle crossed. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. Okay, perfect. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Shachi and Jing, for inviting me today. Uh, I'm Vincent, co-founder of Positive Energy, and Positive Energy simplifies renewable energy financing. Now, renewable energies, as we all know, is a booming industry, but what not everybody knows is that actually Asia is the biggest market. $150 billion was invested in renewables in Asia in 2019, and this is expected to double by 2025. But there's a problem. There's a lot of small to medium-sized projects for which the funding process is not working. We face a lot of project developers that cannot get their projects financed in time, and there's a lot of investors eyeing this market, but are not able to deploy their capital fast enough. The reason is that developers and investors struggle to collaborate. The financing industry in Asia is not as developed as it is in the US or in Europe. A lot of investors, for instance, a developer who's building a $10 million project in the jungles of Indonesia, where would he go for investors? These are local SMEs that lack the capacity to build financial models, compile a good data room, or make flashy presentations that investors are looking for. At the same time, a lot of investors work in very old-fashioned ways. They look at, work with papers, e phone calls, or email at best. This makes the transaction co cost slow and the transaction time way too long. We help these projects with a digital platform. Our digital platform reduces the cost and complexity of financing renewable energy projects. We offer matchmaking. Our projects get global reach to investors and investors can access vetted deal flow on our platform. We digitize the entire investment process with standardized project information, a virtual data room, integrated financial model, and we can create portfolios of projects. And we increase the productivity of our investors with process automation and integrate ESG reporting and certification. We especially focus on small to medium sized projects, projects between one and $50 million. They represent 25% of the market, a huge market opportunity. And especially these small to medium sized projects that struggle to get the financing. In other words, 
we help SME developers to deliver green powers to their community. Rooftop solar, waste to energy, and solar storage projects. We are already the leaders in Asia. Since our launch last year, we have listed $766 million worth of projects in 15 countries. And in May, we secured $23 million worth of term sheets for our clients. We have a first mover advantage. That's why we've grown to over 1,400 professional users. We work with professional investors, and a lot of large investors are already active. Institutional investors, such as banks, funds, private equities, but also industrial players, such as IPPs, utilities, oil and gas, and global renewable energy developers. How do we make money? We work on a success fee model. So how will our 676 million translate into revenues? Well, we have already firmed revenue of 90K USD. If we estimate a success rate of 12.5%, meaning one in every eight project ultimately gets financed, then a 3% success fee and a time to close of six months shows that we can generate a revenue potential of almost $3 million USD. How does it work during COVID? Well, the industry, as well as our company, are extremely resilient during COVID. The power sector is hardly impacted with only an 8% reduction in demand, and infrastructure investments are safe havens in crisis time. Our solution is core during travel restrictions because people have to move online. And that's why April and May have been our busiest months, and that's why we have secured 4 million of deals completely virtually closed. We are currently the only provider of such services in Asia. There's a few competitors, but all of them are based in Europe or the US. And Asia does represent 50% of the market. The M&A world is ready for disruption. There's a few other very generic M&A platforms that have successfully raised huge amounts of money. Positive Energy was founded by energy experts. Our CEO has worked 15 years in energy projects and digital services. I've worked 10 years on complex energy investments in Shell, and our team are all from the industry. We are a for-profit venture, but we want to create positive social impact. Firstly, we can accelerate the deployment of renewable energy due to our digital platform. We can help with green finance development because our digital platform can make such investments more accessible to a wider range of investors. And we want to create local jobs and support local industries because access to financing can enable local SMEs and national champions to complete, compete with large players. We are looking for support. First of all, as a startup, of course, we're always looking for money. We're looking for an angel investment for which we have raised 200K so far to expand our business development, build more platform functionalities and bridge to Series A. But we also want to increase our network. We're looking for investors, looking for opportunities in Asia, or maybe renewable energy companies looking to expand. And potentially our platform can enter the Americas. So we're also looking for those that can help launch our platform. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, we'll let everyone type their questions or feel free to just ask them as well. I think there's a question from Cassie. Oh, I see. Uh, okay, so Cassie says, what partnerships have you initiated, government or private? So we have initiated a few private partnerships. Uh, we're working together with a uh, European ESG consultant uh, to have completely integrated ESG reporting based on projects. So when investors go into a, a project, they can uh, immediately get ESG reporting at spot. Um, we are trying to work on uh, working with development banks. So we're trying to discuss a partnership with the Asia Development Bank. Um, but so far, that's, uh, that's still work in progress. Um, we're also setting up a partnership with a, um, an investment fund that would use our platform exclusively 
uh, for their portfolio analysis. That one is still under MOU. And Jay, so that, oh, Jane says, how are you solving credit issue of SME owners? Yeah, so that's a, that's a big problem. Um, the project is not as much the uh, credit risk of our clients. The problem is the credit risk of the ultimate project. Um, if somebody is building a, a solar farm, uh, a CNI solar farm, uh, on the rooftop of a factory, then the credit risk of our client is not the problem for the investor. It's the credit risk of whosoever roof it's on that's supposed to buy the electricity for the coming 20 years. Um, on the one hand, uh, it's a problem because uh, these companies quite often don't have a credit rating. At the same time, that means they're also willing to pay because they're used to pay 15% interest. So we see our projects generating a 15 to 20% equity IRR uh, to kind of offset that credit risk that people are taking. Great, and one more from Cassie. How are you adapting to the Australian pipeline with the EU? The Australian pipeline? Yes. Which Australian pipeline, sorry? Uh, Cassie, could you elaborate, please? Um, in regards to the Australian pipeline in the works with the EU as a cheaper alternative to solar energy. Okay. Um, I'm not completely aware of that, uh, of that project. Uh, I think at this point, uh, what we see is that solar is still the cheapest form of electricity. Uh, the panels predominantly coming from China, uh, as well as the inverters. So uh, in that sense, it's mostly uh, a regional play. Um, would this pipeline be, 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 be gas, or do you mean the, the, the power pipeline from Australia to Singapore? She says we'll say the latter. Uh, the, so, yeah, so Australia has a very bold plan to, uh, in the middle of the desert, build an enormous amount of solar panels with huge batteries uh, and build a few thousand kilometer of electrical pipeline uh, under the water from Australia to Singapore. Um, it's a very bold plan. It will cost $13 billion and it will, find an, it will, uh, electric, it will provide one third of Singapore's power. Um, it's a very ambitious plan. If they can do it for $13 billion, it's actually very cheap. Um, at the same time, Singapore is only 3 million people in a region with 300 million people. So I don't think it will anything be, uh, be very disruptive for Asia in general. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Vincent. All right, um, thank you. Energy, thank you for being here with us today. Next, we have you capture. All right, thank you. Um, just want to say a quick, quick thank you to Vectors Angel for inviting um, us, you capture, to uh, the deal day today. Very happy to be here. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so I'm I'm Mark uh, Mark Ciadot. I'm the CTO of You Capture where we empower individuals to take action on climate change. Uh, we believe that people all over the world are growing increasingly concerned and anxious about climate change, um, yet they often feel uh, helpless in their own lives when thinking about how to take action personally. Fortunately, UCAPTURE provides a fun, free, and easy way for them to do just that. With just two clicks, you install our browser extension, then when you shop with any of our 25,000 partner websites, we fund carbon offset projects like reforestation and methane capture at no cost to you. We'll also save you money by automatically applying the coupon code that will save you the most money when you're checking out on our partner websites. Save money, save the planet you captured. So like I mentioned, uh, we start from the point of view that, that 
many people want to take action on climate change yet they don't feel they can in, in, in any meaningful way in, in their own lives. Um, and there's a few hurdles to getting people to actually take the action they desire to take. Uh, namely, they don't wanna pay for uh, the solution to climate change, which is to decarbonize uh, the atmosphere. Um, so we address that by making you capture free by funding carbon offset projects funded by our partner websites. Uh, people are also reluctant to change their habits. That's why we're making our technology uh, very easy to use in the way of a browser extension uh, in kind of a set it and forget it mode. And we think people need to be rewarded to enforce a positive feedback loop and to make a great experience so they continue uh, using the product. So our business model is, is pretty simple. It's affiliate marketing. So you capture uh, with our browser extension installed, uh, our users shop uh, with any of our 25,000 partners. Those merchants uh, will pay us a commission from your, from your purchase. Doesn't increase your cost at all. We then take two thirds of that commission and we fund uh, these carbon offset projects and we keep a third as revenue. So like I've been mentioning, our first product um, is our browser extension. You install it with two clicks, very easy. It doesn't bother you unless you land on one of our 25,000 partner sites. One, you click to activate a single click and now that, that now triggers in this example, Walmart to pay us a commission if you were to make a purchase. Again, doesn't increase your cost. And then if I were to get to the checkout page on, on Walmart or any of other of the sites um, and we had coupon codes available, the extension is gonna automatically apply the one that saves the most money. Our second, our second product right now is in development. It's our, our mobile app. Uh, which replicates, um, which there's, there's a few features here. Namely, we're replicating the same browser extension functionality um, in a mobile shopping browser type experience. And we're considering other features like adding AR games or other kind of fun uh, ways to engage people. Third and final product is the card linked uh, solution where our users will be able to register their credit or debit cards and then when they, when they make purchases with our participating uh, merchants, we'll receive a commission, use the same two thirds to fund projects. So really the common theme with all three of these products is we're, we're attempting to build the cost of carbon into consumption, right? We see that as a pretty big issue where uh, the, the cost of carbon isn't accounted for um, when we consume. And that's why um, we're, we're having, uh, climate change as, as big of an issue. If we build the cost of the environmental impact into our consumption itself, we can offset a lot of that. Um, and so this is the slide here that I wanna emphasize for the rest of the presentation. This is our, our white label uh, new product line. So the three products I just went through uh, make up the product suite of our, uh, of our platform. Uh, we were approached by a, by the third largest energy company in Australia, Energy Australia, um, to white label our technology for their use. We're, we're getting ready to deliver that live to 30,000 of their customers um, in the next month or uh, in the next four to six weeks. That's $110,000 of guaranteed revenue for the first year, $50,000 up front, and then $5,000 um, as a monthly uh, maintenance fee for the software. Um, what's really exciting about this is the um, contracts, the, our white label contracts also uh, take into account 33% of the revenue generated by their customers. And so there's huge upside as, as, as our white label clients scale um, uh, their, their use. So this is uh, the, the, the I, I think to reframe this, the, Three products I went through um, earlier make up uh, the product suite of our, our white label technologies. And those three products, what they do is generate commissions from people shopping. You can use those commissions with any type of reward system. In uh, our case, you capture, we're using that, our reward system as carbon offset credits. We're planting trees, we're funding methane capture projects. But for Energy Australia, they're using that same technology and their reward system is uh, month, monthly points uh, or 
um, uh, credit off of uh, their customer's bill. And so we have a pretty generic uh, white label product that can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, we're quite, quite excited to announce that uh, next week we'll be, we'll be announcing, um, we're signing a POC trial with a top 20 global investment bank to do a three month trial of our browser extension white label product uh, with their customers in seven different countries. There's huge, huge potential in uh, our, our, our white label focus. This is a bit of a pivot for, for our company that we've embraced really just over the last few months because the opportunity has come knocking very hard and uh, the, the, the scale um, is, is massive. And what's very exciting is th this, this rewards loyalty shopping is a business of scale. And we've now inverted our business model where we don't have to pay to scale. We actually get paid to scale by charging uh, our, our clients to use our software that they distribute to their customers. Uh, so this, th this makes our business model require far less capital uh, to, to grow to any meaningful scale. Uh, and that's actually in our next, next slide. Uh, so a, a bit of our, 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 our current history, we've been bootstrapped and um, had an angel investor. We participated in a startup accelerator program down in Australia last year. It was actually the lead sponsor of it was Energy Australia, our, our first white label client. We're rounding out our, our product suite um, by the end of next quarter. That's really getting the mobile app uh, delivered and uh, the card link solution. We've recently closed a small investment round from friends and family that were quite eager to invest, especially with the new pivot and the focus on white label. We have capacity for, for, for more capital at this point. Uh, we do think that the, the revenue that we're generating from our white label contracts, as well as our uCapture user base, uh, will be enough in a few months for us to uh, start, start actually turning a profit. Uh, so we're more interested in talking to investors who uh, can be uh, more strategic, but of course we're happy to talk about uh, capital as well. Happy to take any questions. Valentina? Yeah. Um, Mark, thank you for your presentation. I think it's a really great startup. I think my question is how are you communicating the impact that has been made to, I guess, people who use your browser or like these partnerships? Like, do you have a way of measuring and communicating that? We do. So uh, that's, that's a great question. So let's, I think if we just run through an example. So that example, um, uh, let's, let's take Expedia. So Expedia is our number one, our largest uh, merchant partner. Uh, and um, you, make, you, you go to Expedia, the extension activates, you book a flight, Expedia might pay us 5% of your, of, your, of your ticket. We take two thirds of that and fund the projects. The carbon offset projects have a price per ton. And so we're able to compute the amount of CO2 that, that was offset as a result of your purchased flight. And so when that happens, we email our users and give them notifications in the extension saying, congratulations, you offset one ton of CO2 when you made that purchase with Expedia. Okay, great, thank you. You have a question from Cassie. Do you have any marginalized income similar to a Robinhood indexed or used cost? Similar to a, a specific or, marginalized okay. income. Specific to a Robinhood index for you, Scott? So, so, so Cassie, there's a, a price per project. So the carbon offset projects will have a price per ton. And then that's how we're able to compute the amount of CO2 offset from a, from a sale. <clears throat> Okay. 
Okay, and then from Jane, how do you compete with other bigger affiliate marketing platforms if they decide to enter the space? So I think that's that's a great question as well. There are much larger existing affiliate marketing kind of platforms out there that that you're talking about, uh, big names like Rakuten and in Honey and Piggy. Uh, those are all cash back websites. So we we think the value proposition is is very different for users. Our our user base is, uh, you know, very concerned about climate change. It, it's an issue they deeply care about, and they would prefer um, offsetting their footprint versus receiving cash back. So we think they're just different users and uh, you know, us, us being exclusively carbon offsets and exclusively being a brand that embraces and is all about climate change, um, I think is much more valuable than, than a, a cash back site suddenly starting to offer carbon offsets as, a, as an additional um, reward. And one more from Cassie, are you using Bitcoin partners in this? So that's that's another great question. Uh, not not specifically any Bitcoin uh, partners. We uh, are are working with a cryptocurrency exchange down in Australia to make their their platform trading carbon neutral. Um, that's that's the extent of our our crypto involvement. Okay, thank you so much, um, you capture. Next, we have Lupa Bio, and after Lupa Bio, we'll have our 10 minute break. All right, can everyone hear me? Yep. You can see my screen. Hi, um, thanks for the opportunity. My name is Alex Martinez. I'm the co founder and CEO of Lupa Bio, and we are developing a safe new oral drug to treat acute and chronic inflammation. As many of you know, we face an epidemic of inflammatory disease today. This includes the current pandemic we're in, where morbidity and mortality is actually driven by the immune system and untethered and uncontrolled inflammation. In terms of the chronic inflammatory diseases, they're increasing at a staggering rate. That's the first part of our problem. The second part of our problem is that all current drugs have serious or even life-threatening side effects. So for your consideration, our competition is actually part of the problem. As a result, the full population demanding anti-inflammatory therapies is largely inaccessible to the pharmaceutical market. So most patients, about 75% of the epidemiology, they're paying cash for unproven alternative solutions. Dwarfing pharma's current $50 billion annual United States market. So our opportunity is we are the only systemic disease-modifying drug that's safe enough for all patients with an inflammatory disease at all phenotypes of disease, disease severity. So we think the ideal new drug actually originates from a historical mystery, which is that inflammatory diseases often improve or even disappear during pregnancy. So the mechanism behind this really wasn't understood. We, there were no good leads until just a few years ago when sugars from human milk, called human milk oligosaccharides, were discovered to circulate in the blood of pregnant women. This is a very surprising observation because these sugars were really only thought to serve as prebiotics for the infant's microbiome, as well as anti-adhesives for certain pathogens that might want to attach to the infant's gut. So what direct effects do these HMOs have on cells in the body for them to be present in the blood of pregnant women? A research group at UC San Diego screened all 200 of these compounds, and they identified one as a primary anti-inflammatory compound, and we think it may solve this mystery. So our drug is a biomimic of 3SL, the primary anti-inflammatory HMO, and it works through conserved mammalian biology. So next we need to really understand if this works. And so it was tested in animal models of autoimmune disease. In this case, rheumatoid arthritis. I won't go through all of the data here, but what this shows us is that 3SL reduces swelling, cartilage damage, uh, joint inflammation, and even bone erosion, equivalent to today's toxic standard of care, methotrexate. So the next thing we do want to see is if these anti-inflammatory 
disease modifying effects are reproducible in another model of autoimmune disease. And they are. Just this year, in a Nature publication, no less, oral administration of our drug in an atopic dermatitis model was able to reduce skin thickness, epidermal thickness, dermal thickness, mast cell infiltration, and increase Treg production. These are really important if you want to have a disease modifying agent. Again, when we think about the translation of this biology and this conserved, the conserved mammalian receptors, we're really encouraged by the fact that the anti inflammatory observations translate to human monocytes, that's the innate immune system, human T cells, that's the adaptive immune system, and even patient cells. RAF FLS come from human beings with rheumatoid arthritis. A drug with a broad anti-inflammatory profile and exceptional safety rep represents a pipeline within the product, and that's exactly what we're creating. So our initial indication is for actually juvenile idiopathic arthritis uh, and rheumatoid arthritis, um, followed on the heels by atopic dermatitis. We've already completed a positive pre-IND meeting with the FDA where they told us that we can go directly into patients for up to 24 weeks of dosing. So we are a mid-stage clinical asset. Um, within the next few weeks, we're going to be um, submitting an additional pre-IND for COVID-19 associated inflammation and have um, a full protocol synopsis already drafted for that. So we have a very unique team. Um, combined, myself and my co-founder, Jason Ferrone, have over 25 experience in the biotech industry. Um, and we're supported by key opinion leaders for all of our, our critical early indications. We both worked at Ionis Pharmaceuticals um, on the core business team, starting when it was a $500 million company, and today it's a $9 billion company with multiple approved products. So we're inviting you to participate in um, an ongoing round. It's an institutional leverage of up to 1.5 million in convertible notes. It was led by WRF Capital with participation from SOSV. Um, they doubled down on their super pro rata um, that they had as part of our participation in the most recent batch the Bio Accelerator and CRCM Ventures as well as other angel investors have also participated. I would also like to note at this point that I was the first six-figure six check into Google Bio. So I speak to you not only as a founder, but as an angel investor myself. Um, we're filling out the rest of the, the bridge. We had up to 690 left. We just received 100K commitment. And all of this is going towards operational CMC and clinical supply, getting ready to move into the clinic. Thank you for your time. Glenn says, Alex, talk about the size of the market. Sure, I may have glossed over it. So uh, US prescription anti-inflammatory market is about $50 billion. Globally, this is it's about $175 billion. That's for uh, F, you know, FDA or FDA equivalent regulated uh, drugs. Um, the, the opportunity that, that we're trying when, when I look at it is that the majority of the population is actually a cash market. Um, it's about $70 billion in the U.S., and it's several hundred billion dollars um, in, in the, um, the, the global markets. IP comes in the form of an exclusive therapeutic license from UC San Diego, and Lupa has already um, filed and, and, and gone PCT with a couple of wholly owned ones, including pain and including um, pathogen-associated pneumonia. What have other clinical assets sold for? Um, just to give you an idea, um, a couple of recent IND candidates, so exact same stage as us for atopic derm, have gone for $500 million in bio bucks each within the past two years. And those were, uh, those were the histamine-oriented uh, drugs, so they actually have less utility and broader anti-inflammatory uh, 
uh, indications. So uh, to Gwen's question, I would say the fact that this is safe and, and we actually have human clinical data already equivalent to a full phase one program with no AEs. Uh, in terms of the toxicology data we have, the, the compound looks like it's an inert. The LD50, which is, is sort of the, the number of animals that die unfortunately when you dose high enough, um, that has never been reached with our drug. It currently stands 20 grams per kilogram per day. Um, this is five times less toxic than baking soda based on those data with zero animals dead at those doses. The product's oral, it would be daily. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so oh. much, Alex. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me and the great questions, everyone. Uh, we'll now have our 10 minute break. So everyone, please stay online, but go ahead and feel free to get some water, use the bathroom, and we will come back at 7.50 with M Fluidic.
Sachi, you're on mute. Oh, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we're just going to hop right back into it with Charlie from Mfluidics. All right. Can you, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Yeah, just wanted to thank uh, Vector Angels for letting me pitch today. My name is Charlie Ye. Uh, I'm the CEO of Mfluidex. Imagine if you have a kid and the kid is coughing, you take the kid to the doctor. Uh, the doctor would first uh, take a look at the symptoms, uh, see maybe there's fever, maybe uh, there's cough in his head. He's trying to guess, uh, is this COVID or is this flu or is this something else? You could use other technologies uh, such as the antibody test, which is similar to the pregnancy test. It's very low cost, um, very simple, fast, but it has very low sensitivity. Um, the most sensitive test is the PCR test, which, uh, by the way, is the most uh, common way to test for COVID right now. Um, it is highly sensitive, but it has a very low, tur uh, slow turnaround. This is because uh, typically these machines are very high cost and all of these are uh, batched into centralized labs. So you need to send the sam samples over and it takes several days to, for results. We are developing the simple chip and this has been funded by the Gates Foundation, uh, spin out technology from UC Berkeley uh, for bacterial and viral testing in 15 minutes. The user simply uh, takes a nasal, nasal swab, puts that in a microfluidic chip, puts the chip into a reader, optical reader, and the optical reader ports the data out to a backend app. There is a huge blue sea market for this uh, because currently all of the PCR testing, they're really localized into centralized labs or uh, hospitals. And this is less than 10K uh, settings in, in America. If one can develop a point of care test and deploy in primary care settings, uh, you could deploy this in more than 200,000 uh, settings in America, which is completely untapped right now. One of the core technologies that we have is uh, something called the vacuum microfluidics technology developed from UC Berkeley. Uh, here, what you're seeing is uh, a video showing uh, hundreds of microwells loading with um, reagents, and we're running uh, many DNA tests in these. They're called isothermal amplification tests. Um, and the key advantage of this technology is that it is much simpler than conventional micro microfluidics. Um, it, which makes the entire system multiple slower costs. In addition, we have integrated a automated sample prep system with this uh, microfluidics, and we have shown uh, equivalent yield of sample preparation, DNA purification, but it's five times faster than uh, manual preparation protocols. The chip also has multi-target testing capacity. So we can look at uh, a dozen, two dozen diseases in one single patient. And the most exciting data that we have so far is a uh, recent uh, results showing a 10 minute COVID-19 uh, assay. So this is uh, approximately 10 times faster than status quo PCR and it has fairly good sensitivity similar to PCR. So that's really, really exciting for us. Uh, we've also tested the specificity for, for this across uh, 22 common respiratory pathogens, and right now we have 100% specificity. So high, high, super high speed, high sensitivity, high uh, specificity. We have completed the NSF I4 program and uh, to validate the business model. And out of that directly came uh, as a result, uh, phase two, one and phase two SBIR grants, uh, totaling 1.8 million. We have currently another pipeline for a 3 million SBIR grant under review right now. Compared to the competition, uh, these are the competition on market. M we will be delivering much more targets uh, than uh, average 
companies, except uh, while matching BioFire, but we will be five times faster than the BioFire system. And our assay price and reader price will be ten, at least 10 times uh, less cost than uh, the BioFire system. And it will be lower cost than any other uh, solution on market right now. So the patents uh, have been licensed from UC Berkeley exclusively. Uh, they have been uh, granted in uh, UK, Germany, France, uh, China, and USA. Uh, and there's three patent families. Uh, it has been published in top tier journals um, and a freedom to operate analysis has been done as well. Our team, myself, uh, I did my PhD in the uh, joint bioengineering program at UC Berkeley, UCSF. Uh, I have uh, written and managed over $3 million uh, of grants uh, in my career. Uh, our CSO comes from Roche. He has uh, three decades uh, of molecular diagnostics uh, product development experience. Uh, we have another PhD, so three PhDs in total in the team. We have Todd. Um, which is a uh, automation engineer. So uh, we are batch three of IndieBio. We're also alumni of the Citrus Foundry and also uh, uh, Skydeck uh, program. And we have been selected as one of the top 20 startups from 900 global startups uh, in TechCrunch. We are opening up a safe note investment uh, opportunity, 400K. Uh, and the objective of this is to help us deploy a FDA emergency use authorization assay for the COVID assay in the next three months. Uh, our track record is uh, 2x valuation increase year over year uh, for the past uh, three years. Thank you. Question from Gwen, uh, price of the hardware and consumable. Uh, so the uh, consumable will be 10 times lower cost than uh, BioFire. Uh, the hardware will be less than $1,000. Uh, so it will be uh, multiples lower cost than uh, any of the commercial solutions out there right now. Uh, question, your technology seems to be on microlytics. Can you explain the DNA test? Uh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to uh, mention the uh, chemistry itself is, uh, is one of our innovations as well. Uh, so we have a 10-minute uh, uh, isothermal amplification chemistry. So that's a huge, huge uh, thing. Um, and besides the microfluidics, also the integration of the system is very important. How, to, how do you get a full automation process from sample prep to readout? So that's uh, the three things that we focus on. Another question, uh, samples are nasal swabs. Uh, that is uh, correct. Uh, for the first product, that is correct. Uh, it is a general sample te uh, technology. So you can take blood, you can take urine. Uh, that's, that's all adoptable. Another question, what other viruses and bacteria are you com contemplating next? Yes, that's a great question. So our very first uh, product is actually a panel for respiratory diseases, and it will be the common ones that uh, you see in primary care, such as influenza. And out of this panel, we're gonna be adding uh, COVID to that panel. So uh, we will be the only uh, one that has a COVID panel uh, at the price range that can actually deploy in primary care. Uh, the another question: What other viruses? Uh, yes, sorry, I already, I already saw this <laughs> answer. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, go ahead and answer Nancy's question. Uh, so, who will purchase the product? So, we will be uh, selling this to physicians, uh, small physician offices, uh, and pharmacies uh, as a clear waved, clear waved product. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Next, we have Cal Wave. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can. Okay, perfect. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Marcus, co-founder and CEO of CalWave Powered. And yeah, by now it became very evident that climate change is uh, not only the number one risk to uh, human life and other life on Earth, but also to our economy. And so I realized that risk pretty early on, I started working on solar power right out of high school uh, with solar race cars, uh, solar thermal and, and other um, renewable architectures. And then that led me to, um, yeah, renewable innovations. Right now, it's a good time where you might ask yourself, you have a crisis at home, why not escape to an island? But the reality is that um, yeah, most of the islands are actually in pretty uh, dire situations, they, and that's mostly due to the lack of access to affordable and competitive power. And yeah, to give you a sense, this represents still 11% of the global population, so more than one out of 10 people have no access to water and they live on um, yeah, island uh, nations, uh, small islands that um, yeah, are mostly dependent on diesel generators. Um, so they're dependent on imports. Um, and yeah, the, the emissions from these diesel generators are nearly as high as uh, from a coal power plant. And so now the question is, yeah, why not just use wind and solar? The challenge here is, and, and we heard that earlier, that um, yeah, wind and solar are pretty volatile, are not available at night, um, on a daily basis, are not available in the winter. Wave power is actually the third largest renewable resource, especially for island nations that often live off tourism, where yeah, the visual impact of wind and solar are also prohibitive, as well as the hurricane. And so wave power is the third largest renewable resource, 50 times Answer, it's much more consistent and predictable. So we can see from the chart in green, and yeah, we can produce power at night as well as in the winter, and by that really cut down the percentage of wind power available. So in the beginning of wind, and that's not long ago, it wasn't actually clear how the winning design would look like. Until now, the three-blade upwind design emerged as the dominant design for two main reasons. It's the most efficient, and we can well, for wave power, we're still lacking such a solution of all the dominant designs. That's why in 2015, the Department of Energy started the US Wave Energy Prize to identify exactly that kind of next generation technology. So our team together with 92 other um, comp competitors entered. Um, and yeah, here just a, a first brief introduction to our team. We're currently seven full time uh, for co partnerships in total since 2014. Um, uh, with the yeah, significant background in the offshore space as well as uh, in the more design and engineering role in the industry. And the technology we brought forward to the US Wave Energy Prize was a, a completely novel approach of not being on the surface that actually allows us to survive storms, which has been the main challenge so far for the industry. And at the same time, um, yeah, we're also not at the bottom where you have low efficiency. At least like the wind turbine, we found a solution that um, has a very high performance. At the same time, we can autonomously. And yeah, because of um, these two key features, we were awarded by US Wave Energy Prize with a half a million. Um, and yeah, since then, i um, received over um, 10 million in DOE awards. Um, and yeah, Um, that was started in 2017, and then in um, last year, 2019, received another 4.7 million in DOE contract. And yeah, we're currently still uh, raising a, a 500k seed round that is nearly closed. Um, so we received investments from SOA, Breakout Labs, and the High Tide Foundations. And we have a couple of uh, open tickets here for um, for the seed round. Um, yeah, and now our next milestone is a pilot um, at Scripps in Southern California. Um, yeah, we've received all the permits for that demonstration and started the construction. Since then, it's been unfortunately delayed due to COVID. We now plan to pick our manufacturing um, facilities, but we're still planning to deploy a first pilot um, later this year. And next to that, we've also developed um, a smaller unit um, specifically for kind of the ocean sensing 
in, in, in the blue economy market and by the NOAA and DOE um, ocean observing price. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, specifically. And you can see yeah, it can be deployed from small vessels. The key innovation here is an inflatable hole, um, so it can be yeah, stored easily then that can be inflated inside and deployed in a very lightweight crane. So um, that, that was one of the challenges in the actual operations that was um, demanding. So a, a small and lightweight device is very Um, entrance market, yeah, we're also in touch with a eco resorts in French Polynesia, and um, yeah, that was um, planning to start um, the first project there then from 2022 onwards. And in the long run, yeah, wave power has the potential to provide up to a third of global energy demand, and Cal Wave has. Um, and yeah, if you want to learn more, please visit us at calwave.energy or directly reach out to me and I can get you guys some questions. Saw the chat. I hope you were able to hear me well. No, it might be your headphones, Marcus. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. You could have <laughs> told me. Um, okay, go ahead and ask any questions you have. Um, you might need to repeat um, some of the information. Okay, Alan says, what is the difference between you and EcoWave Power? Yeah, EcoWave Power is exactly that category of surface-based devices that has um, yeah, no means to survive storms. So they're mostly um, tied to harbor walls so far. Um, so that essentially limits their market size. They need a physical reference point and um, harbors are usually not in very energetic sites. So if we're talking um, really wave farms in, in, the, in the gigawatt size as offshore wind farms, you have to be out in open ocean. Um, and we're actually planning to co-locate with offshore wind. That's one of the great avenues to um, scale rapidly with, with project financing. And so um, surface-based device, devices have no means to survive the severe conditions there and, and, and this project financing. Um, yeah, so they have a different, um, yeah, different market or niche market, I would say. In terms of corrosion for salt water, and that's something, of course, we've been looking into um, since the very beginning. And we're really transferring um, state-of-the-art technology from oil and gas and from offshore wind um, so they've, um, yeah, offshore wind in Europe um, is a significantly uh, growing and large part of the renewable energy portfolio in the US, there are 25 gigawatt in, in the um, offshore wind pipeline. So we're using the same anti-corrosion technologies. Um, state government, yeah, um, California um, just started to um, add offshore wind into the areas of interest. We're actually funded by DOE to deploy in Oregon. Um, so that will be our first grid connected pilot at PacWave. There is a 20 megawatt um, wave energy test site under development. And yeah, we're one of the, the few companies funded by DOE to um, conduct a grid connected pilot there in, in 2022. Um, in terms of biggest competitors, um, yeah, there is a, a very good overview on the European Marine Energy website. They have a, a great overview of all active developers. Um, great, yeah, then thanks so much. And as I said, please um, directly reach out and i um, happy to answer more questions. Um, small installations.
Yep, our onshore components are really just a grid connection. So um, for the smaller scale, as well as the, the utility scale markets, we're essentially a very close analogy to offshore wind farms. So we, we can use the same infrastructure and that's actually great because that's a very proven supply chain, a very project financeable. Um, so yeah, and we can utilize the, the same um, even existing infrastructure. So we're thinking of upgrading offshore wind farms as they develop and, and grow in the US as well as European markets. For the smaller markets here, really lightweight and ease of deployment is critical. So we've designed it with kind of the local vessels in mind, um, yeah, as, as said for the pilot at French, in French Polynesia. Um, yeah, we know what the available vessels there are and, and that's what we've designed the unit for. Um, so the onshore component is really just a grid connection. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Marcus. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, and next we have Lynn Grove. All right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, please let me know if um, you guys suddenly can't hear me. And let's see. Share the screen. That's the one. You guys see that? Yes. Okay, great. So um, Joe Lindfax, CEO of Lingrove, thanks to Vector Angels. Uh, and great to hear all of your stories. Um, I'm excited to share Lingrove's vision for a world made from clean and carbon negative materials. Uh, let's see. So this is an image of an old growth tree, uh, such as the redwoods we have here in Northern California, where we're based. Uh, the remarkable thing about old growth wood like this is that it has a higher stiffness to weight ratio than steel, but only 10% of these trees remain. And so today's construction and building is done with uh, compromised materials, carbon intensive materials, concrete steel, uh, and legacy green materials like plantation wood, which are lower performance and insufficiently sustainable to make the dent that we need to reduce that 11% uh, and are often higher cost. Our technology is patented. It's bioengineered stronger than wood fiber combined with stronger than wood resin to make a composite from renewables. Uh, it's a massively scalable roll-to-roll -roll process, which we've actually already proven scalability. Uh, and it's structural as well as aesthetic, much like wood itself. Our initial market, our go-to-market strategy uh, revolves around interiors. Uh, it's a high margin market, which is why that's what we're focused on. It includes walls, furniture, ceiling, flooring, uh, roughly that order. And here it is, ECOA, branded material. It's a veneer to start with. Uh, and it's a combination of, of the endangered wood COA with ECO. Uh, we believe that this is a brand that will change uh, how people perceive of materials and, and um, we've scaled the surfacing product already. It's, a it's available on rolls today. It has the look and feel of wood as you can see, but with a lower carbon footprint and higher performance, uh, which is very important when we are talking about introducing a new material to the market. Uh, it's all about performance. People have been burned with biomaterials before, and uh, we have tested our material for durability to structural skin, so we can create panels with it as well. Uh, the promise of very high strength to weight, lightweight structures to further reduce carbon. Um, and as a natural finish, uh, you can see the sort of old growth wood aesthetic. Uh, that's a big benefit. When we talk about uh, carbon, uh, every ton of the fiber reduces carbon by 1.4 tons from cultivation to factory. Uh, and uh, our resin is uh, as close to carbon neutral as possible. It's bio-based and has the highest certification for um, uh, clean chemistry. So it does not off-gas. But it's also clean in the sense that it's easily cleanable, uh, bleachable, and it's a hard surface. So when people go back to the office uh, and when people renovate their homes, they're looking for materials like this that are high performance and clean, but don't off gas themselves like laminates and uh, Prop 65 urethanes and other things that off gas. 
the high performance aspect is another major benefit, as mentioned. So it's the high stiffness, lighter than carbon, stiffer than fiberglass and steel. Um, and we already have a small plant family of products with different finishes. Uh, we're going to be growing these uh, four finishes to 10 along with a structural panel that we've already produced. Uh, and, you know, this application is perfect for um, stuff like room dividers and, uh, and wall renovations that we see are going to be a big part of coming back to the workplace for employees in the COVID era. Uh, we have traction with some of the largest players, so three of the five largest furniture brands, uh, largest wall covering distributor, um, and two out of the largest ceiling panel, as well as flooring companies. Uh, lots of applications, which is why we're focused mostly on furniture and walls today. Uh, we also have a direct to specifier, so architects and designers and contractors program, where we're selling directly to them. Uh, this is an example of sort of both grow to mark, go to market and, and our uh, strategy for scaling. Uh, so you can see here focused initially with Wolf Gordon, largest wall covering distributor on walls, uh, Steelcase, largest for, uh, furniture brand in commercial, um, in furniture, and then uh, moving to acoustic panels with USG uh, and uh, Mohawk for flooring. Our business model uh, is very uh, basic in the sense that we are selling a highly scalable product. Uh, we combine uh, proprietary uh, eco resin and flax fiber that we've patented to make roll stock. Uh, that's how lots of things are made. And uh, we're using uh, kind of traditional uh, roll to roll technology that uh, allows us to produce a thousand miles already a year. Um, we're tackling the high margin uh, wall covering market followed by furniture and flooring. And as we scale uh, to be competitive those markets, our, our margins, gross margins will go down, but overall volume will go up. Uh, our two main products are moldable veneer and the panel. These are massive markets, uh, legacy markets that are ready for disruption. And so uh, today we're focused on these uh, surfacing products. So, um, you know, veneer is one term that people use in the wood world. Laminate is another term. Um, this is a very large total adjustable market, and, and we believe that with our differentiated product, we can capture a very large SAM. When we add panels, uh, that SAM doubles. And then as far as competitors today, uh, you know, we're actually price competitive. Uh, in fact, we're cheaper than a lot of wood veneers already, and that's just going to... Um, you know, that margin will just increase for us uh, and differentiate, and we'll be able to differentiate further. We're also really the, the only truly uh, ecological and clean solution. Uh, this is my fourth startup. Uh, two of the previous ones are still going and very successful. My co-founder, Elaine, who can't join us today because it's Saturday, uh, it heads up our uh, sales and has, as her third startup, uh, head of BD. We're both um, product designers by training, and we have a team of seven, as well as a robust group of advisors. Uh, we're raising 300K on a safe. Uh, we've raised roughly three quarters of a million to date, um, and we span, spun out of another company, which has allowed us to be very cash efficient. We're raising this money to uh, bridge us to uh, a Series A, uh, as well as to achieve our milestones with some of these large business-to-business -business customers that um, I shared with you guys previously. And I look forward to your questions, and thanks again for uh, inviting us to present. Uh, so first question, are we selling out of the side of the United States? Yes, uh, we currently ship all over the world. 
Um, we have suppliers all over the world and um, manufacturing partners in the East Coast and West Coast. Uh, uh, so that answers that question. Um, our product is not currently carbon negative, uh, but it's the lowest carbon in the category and our main input, the natural fiber is carbon negative. We use the lowest carbon um, resin uh, and uh, we use renewable energy to produce our product. So we anticipate being carbon negative uh, in the future, and that's the one of the things that is going to be part of our Series A. Um, furniture partners, uh, so as mentioned, Steelcase, largest commercial furniture company in the world, as well as two of their competitors that we are not allowed to state here. Um, and, uh, and so uh, one of our primary go-to markets is hand-in-hand uh, -hand with these industry partners who have the established relationship and the credibility. Um, and then as far as other sales channels, uh, we are selling our um, surface material, our surfacing material, or veneer, uh, directly to architects and designers. So if you guys know of any projects, uh, we would love to send you a sample. Uh, and, uh, and we're based in San Francisco, and so I think a lot of you guys are in this sort of general area, and um, be happy to, to get that out to you um, sooner rather than later. Okay. Oh, <laughs> um, thanks, Joe. Thank uh, that was Lynn Grove. And next we have MedStack. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent. All right. We'll fire that up. Share first. All right. Our presentation coming up okay? All right, great. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Balaji Gopalan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of MedStack. Uh, we're a company that is helping other organizations um, address one of the world's biggest challenges by way of technology. Uh, so obviously I've been tremendously inspired by everything that we've seen here tonight across all the different sectors. Uh, so thank you to the, my fellow entrepreneurs for the work that they do and for Vectors for setting up this opportunity. Um, so just to talk a little bit about the space that we're in, uh, we're focused on digital healthcare, and uh, this has been a really interesting time for the digital health industry. Uh, we're actually coming off of the biggest year that digital health has ever had, um, the most amount of money that was ever raised in this space in the 12-month period. And interestingly, this is kind of a trend that existed even before COVID, really driven by, as was mentioned earlier, the prevalence of chronic conditions and the need to rethink healthcare and the way that it works in this space. Um, and so um, interestingly, of course, now with the situation that we're in with the pandemic, there's an even more attention on the role that technology can play in the healthcare space. Out of every sector that's growing in software technology, telemedicine is actually the fastest because we've had to really think the way that healthcare actually works. The challenge, however, though, is for people who are building applications in the healthcare space, getting to market is really, really, really difficult. Uh, no matter what happens in the field of healthcare technology, the notion of data privacy and security is still the number one concern amongst the people who are buying these technologies, which are largely the CIOs, the hospitals, and insurance companies, and have very high standards that need to be met for them to continue to be compliant to the regulations um, that are beholding them. But unfortunately, with the vendors that they work with, when they do privacy and security audits on the way that these applications manage healthcare data, only 5% actually pass these audits. And so this is actually the challenge in adoption of these technologies. And so what we do as a company is we automate this entire process. And so we have a system that develops these commitments for the healthcare industry and, uh, and pre-writes them. And then with those commitments, we provide a system for these software application developers to make those commitments real in the applications they've built. We have a system that takes the questions that the hospital's insurance companies ask, matches them to these pre-written privacy policies that are generated by our system in line with the healthcare privacy laws, and then provide an opportunity for our customers to build infrastructure using industry standard tools to back their applications with these security and privacy protocols built in, so therefore automatically they're meeting the expectations of the industry. And then we have uh, tooling that helps them prove that they're actually meeting these regulations in real time 
thereby getting them to market much faster and reducing the amount of time and money it costs to bring the digital world to the healthcare industry. And we do this actually for a whole bunch of companies already. So we're working with about 70 different healthcare uh, technology companies in fields such as telemedicine, uh, medical devices, chronic condition management, healthcare concierge, AI for drug discovery, and a whole bunch of all other fields. It's a wide range. The only common thread between them is they're dealing with health data in the cloud, and that is the biggest question they ask when they're actually trying to commercialize. But what's more interesting is who they work with. So our customers rely on us to prove that they're managing data security properly for their downstream customers. And they actually bring us to the table and say, we're using MedStack. Here's how MedStack allows us to meet all of your expectations around the way that you're protecting data. And so here's some of the organizations that we have worked with on behalf of our customers by way of our automation system that meets their requirements. And so we are a SaaS platform. It's very easy to do privacy and security uh, through a services business, but that's actually not where we are. We automate the entire thing. We're sitting at 65,000 in monthly revenue right now, and we're coming off the single best quarter we've ever had, which is a combination of um, a rethought pricing model, repositioning, and of course, the great interest that exists in digital health today. Um, we sit at about an average of $900 a month per customer, and they say average because of course our customers grow, and as they grow, they need more security technology and they need more infrastructure, and so our revenue actually grows uh, with them. Uh, but this has been the most successful quarter we've ever had. And, you know, I mean, the thing that's more important for me, uh, I'm in the kind of business where I help other entrepreneurs and their success drives our success. And so we look at testimonials like this as an indication for what we're doing and why it's, uh, why it's effective. Um, so very quickly on the way our, our business model actually works, it is a platform fee that's tiered based on the types of services they're using from us. And then we simply pass through the cost from the underlying cloud infrastructure. So as you can guess, we are sitting on top of the major cloud providers with a small markup for the security technology we add on top of that configuration to lock down and manage it that makes those policies and those commitments actually real. Um, we're not the only player in the space. A few other people have, uh, that have presented tonight have, have indicated that it's good to have competitors and we think so too. Um, this problem of making the cloud work for healthcare has been around for a little while, but it's just never been as urgent as it is now. Fortunately, we think you know, we're the only ones that are making this solution accessible to the fastest growing area of digital health, which is the early stage companies, and also removing restrictions for how they build their products. So they can actually br bring a demo app to the MedStack platform using standard Docker technology can get up and running and be compliant out of the box right away. Um, and so we're a beta SMB company and we're really inspired by organizations that operate in this space. And so we rely heavily on uh, digital marketing and on content and, uh, and thought leadership across areas of entrepreneurship, security infrastructure, compliance and healthcare uh, to, drive our, to drive our acquisition. And 40% of our leads come from referrals because of org, uh, initiatives like this. So we have a bunch of partnerships with people who are curating digital health, entrepreneurship, and innovation communities. And of course, now we've doubled down on organizations that are driving innovation specifically in response to COVID. We have a number of programs in place because of that. Um, our team is what makes all of this possible. We're a team of seven um, based in Canada, uh, but I'd like to just talk about a couple of us. Um, I, I'm the CEO of the company. I've been building platform businesses for 15 years across a bunch of different industries. I'm really excited by the idea of helping other companies build things. Um, and I partnered with Simon. This, uh, this is Simon's third company. He's an Apple alum, a graduate of the University of Waterloo, a digital security expert, um, and he built healthcare applications for 10 years. We have a crack team across DevOps, security, compliance, digital health entrepreneurship, and, uh, and, and digital health marketing. Um, so really quickly on how we'd love for you guys to be a part of this opportunity, there's a couple of ways. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a company that's, that's raising, uh, that's generating revenue and is thriving in this world of a shift in focus to digital health. Uh, we expect to reach a million in ARR by the end of the year, profitability in our current business by next year. We're currently sitting at about 10 months of runway, We've raised about $2.3 million to date uh, across convertibles and a seed round. And right now we're doing an extension on our seed round. And because we have such pressure on our growth, we've actually decided to be very aggressive with it. And we're simply extending our 2018 seed round 
uh, with, a, with a bridge, uh, which is a $6 million pre-valuation. Uh, We're raising half a million dollars, um, closed half of it yesterday, and uh, we have a, a, the other half remaining. Um, besides all that, of course, anybody who's working with anybody who's building digital health technologies in the cloud, we can help you get to market 60% faster, and we'd love to chat. My name is Balaji. Thank you very much for your time. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Jacob. Appreciate the comment. Um, hi, yeah, how are, we, how are we working to, to access enterprise clients? That is the biggest question we get. And uh, we spent a lot of time kind of thinking about this. We, we said, you know, what's the fastest way to get to market? Everybody knows the sales cycle in healthcare is really, really long. And the biggest growth, both in terms of innovation and the newest things happening, and where all the attention is going is on these bleeding edge companies beyond the major healthcare IT companies. And, uh, and so we said enabling them is the best way for us to build a reputation and to build traction uh, in the market. And now we're starting to get some of the healthcare enterprises coming to us saying, well, we've worked with two or three of your customers. Why don't we just work with you and pre-certify your platform as uh, an entry uh, model for us onboarding third-party digital technology? Um, and, and this idea of a marketplace for the digital health apps, or if you will, the healthcare app store, is really the intention of what we want to do next year and, uh, and will be driven by our, by our series today. Um, we are getting more and more attention from larger, larger customers, but a lot of healthcare enterprises actually don't build their own software. They rely on HIT companies and they rely on these startups who are working with their individual departments, and that's who we're actually going after. Uh, what does competitive market look like? Yeah, great. Um, I did talk about it. Um, so, you know, it's it's a new area. This idea of taking cloud tools and making them usable by the developer community to build applications in this highly regulated and highly sensitive area. I mean, a health record on the black market is worth 35 times out of a credit card. There's a lot of sensitivity on that. Uh, we're most often compared to companies like Aptable and Datica. It's a really interesting thing, though, is that both of those companies uh, have made pivots recently, which actually opened up the market opportunity for us tremendously. Um, Datica is looking more at educational institutions, looking more at data interoperability models. Uh, Aptable has sort of looked beyond healthcare. Um, and so we are glad we weren't the first to do this because we learned a lot from the things that they've done. Um, the biggest thing we focused on is making it really easy for developers and tying the privacy policies to the way the infrastructure actually works line by line. We're the only ones that do that. And a lot of that is powered by a proprietary backup system that, uh, that's built specifically for the healthcare industry and its expectations. Uh, any plans to export service? Great question. Um, so, MedSAC is actually already running in several markets, uh, Canada, the United States, Latin America, Middle East, Australia, Singapore. Um, interestingly, every time we go into a new market, we look at their privacy laws and map it back to the policy set that we have, which is MAC2 HIPAA primarily. And by and large, in most cases, it actually works. Um, the requirement might be to host the data in country, for example. So we think we have a great opportunity to expand. I will say that there are some markets which look at data privacy very differently that might be a bit of a challenge for us to go at. We are a privacy first company. That is what we do, that's what we geek out over. So China is probably pretty far off in the future for us. Japan, Germany maybe, but everywhere else in the world, including India is definitely a possibility. And international expansion, starting with Europe, is a priority for us next year. We're getting a lot of inbound interest on that. Okay, great. Thank you, Balaji. Um, it is- yeah, thank you so much for being here. It is uh, past 7.30 and we still have a couple of startups to go. So anyone who needs to leave now, thank you so much for being with us. Um, and everyone else, I hope you can join us for a little bit longer. Um, but thanks for being here this evening. Uh, next we have Rewalk.
Hi there. Sorry about that. <laughs> thank you, um, Vector Angels, and thank you for everyone who's uh, staying on board. My name is Pradeep Nibber. I'm uh, the CEO and co-founder of Rewalk Power, and uh, thrilled to be here. Great presentation. So uh, Rewalk Power is a SaaS platform uh, that helps companies measure their climate impact and to manage their renewable uh, generation investments. Uh, so, uh, we know that the world is changing. We've heard it in many other presentations. We know that there's this transition happening to more renewables and that the market is rewarding entities that can actually produce meaningful emission reductions. The challenge, though, is that um, emission reductions are often overestimated um, and they can be overestimated by more than 50%. Actually, um, Berkeley and uh, Stanford have both put out papers that speak very much to this, um, that they came out. Uh, the challenge is that with renewable generation, it's really difficult to track production to consumption across multiple devices, um, across multiple carbon accounting programs, and then across multiple stakeholders. So that means for small to medium-sized generators, uh, the costs often outweigh the revenue um, to access revenue from carbon markets. And, uh, and because of the difficulty in measuring all of the different types of devices that come on board, there's an opportunity to um, miss the goals and miss goals about actually how we reduce our, our um, our energy consumption and how we reduce our emissions. So our solution is really focused on simplifying the accounting, the car automating the carbon accounting process, and then managing that renewable electricity fleet. We've built a solution that allows us to connect to any device using um, an API structure. We collect process uh, data from um, solar, um, electric vehicle charging stations, wind generation, a variety of different sources. Uh, we have built um, analytical models and machine learning models that allow us to predict and estimate um, the quality of the data that we are uh, that we are receiving, and then to use uh, use that clean, uh, healthy data to execute on transactions. And the first set of transactions that we've been working on is really around how do we simplify the carbon, um, you know, accounting for carbon offsets, renewable energy credits in, um, in not just the Canadian market, but also in uh, the California market. So it is about making um, the ability to claim carbon assets uh, more profitable. Right now, the process that uh, requires the data management and reporting, there's the compliance component and then the contract settlement typically eats up more than 85% of the actual revenue of participating in these markets. Um, through automation, we have um, shown that it, we're able to actually drop that to, um, we're actually able to reverse those numbers. So 85% is actually going back to the, uh, the generator. So we have a business model that is fairly sticky. Uh, we charge a percentage of a transaction fee for anything that is executed using our platform and then an annual subscription model. Uh, we are right now working through transactions that would add 2200 megawatts of generation to our platform over uh, the next year. And um, uh, right now, that's about $2,600 of um, annual operating revenue to us uh, per megawatt. And um, you know, with that 2,200 um, megawatts of generation, uh, that could equate to $5.7 million of annualized revenue. And that's what we're currently working towards. Um, in terms of traction, we started in our home market. I'm based out of Alberta, Canada, um, an oil and gas hub. Um, that is very much dealing with what it means to transition to 
a low carbon future and what that looks like and the role that renewables will play. We currently have um, a thousand sites reporting to our platform despite COVID and the slowdown in um, projects actually being built, um, we've still managed to see a growth of uh, projects that are actually still operating, reporting to our platform. Uh, we are also still moving forward uh, conversations that would allow us to expand into the United States, looking at the California market uh, and Washington state first, um, and also uh, in discussions with projects in the UK. We really are leveraging the network effect. So we've um, started with municipalities. Um, they have leverage with utilities because they're investing. They're these small, um, they have limited budgets. They, they are investing. They are subject to government grants. That's where they rely on their funding, but they want to be able to see across these renewable energy fleets that they're actually meeting their targets. They have the relationship with the utilities. There's many public utilities that are now responsible for actually executing um, these, this transition. And then we also work specifically and directly with the generators themselves. Our competitors in this space, um, there are many. As we've heard, having competitors, competitors is a good thing. So um, our main competition really is the status quo. It's a highly fragmented market with a lot of uh, complexity in it. Um, our unique offering where we think we sit is that partnering or matching the automation with um, high compliance. So these are not voluntary credits, although we do execute voluntary transactions as well, but these are setting um, a very high standard for what it means to be carbon neutral or carbon, um, you know, or actually creating the carbon offset, what that accounting actually looks like. Um, I focused on the uh, accounting side because that is my background. I spent uh, my early part of my career at KPMG um, and then transitioned into risk management and process and controls design. I had my first exit um, of a risk management software uh, in 2015. Uh, I've partnered with um, Julian, uh, one of my uh, now best friends, who is um, a senior full stack architect, but has been the CTO of five other companies. Um, so really experienced. And then to round out the team, uh, we have uh, Ray Pan, who has developed our blockchain solution, is a controls uh, engineer as well. And then um, Dr. Tarun Chari, who is our lead engineer, comes with background in mathematics, a PhD from Columbia. Um, to take on the way that um, audits happen in the energy space, um, we have, uh, we are very lucky to be supported by such a great team of advisors and partners. Uh, I want to point out Dr. Christine Shu. Um, she actually has written the International Account Emissions Accounting Standards um, and is part of the ISO committee that contributes to the, how those update every year. Uh, also, I want to point out um, Gerd, uh, who is um, the former head of Siemens Ventures. So we're building these partnerships with um, both the large and the small organizations uh, to create a pathway for you know, distributed clean energy at any scale. Um, what our ask is, we're inviting people to participate in a $1.5 million um, financing round. Uh, we have raised $750,000 um, as a part of our angel round. Uh, we have started to focus on what our two market strategy is uh, and it's part of our expansion. Uh, we also have LOIs that are now starting to get approved and um, so building our team so that we can do some of the project execution as well as um, you know uh, supporting our development team as well. Thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to take questions.
I know that was very, I may have ran through that, so. Yeah, um, so the approaches that we use to, um, to connect with potential customers uh, has been uh, a lot through uh, channel partners. So we are members of the Energy Futures Lab and uh, Decentralized Energy Canada. They have helped us provide access to, um, to both utility and municipal customers. Uh, we have also, um, gotten some attention with uh, through like the Canadian um, it's called the Canadian technology um, partnership which helps bring Canadian companies down to the United States um, so we've been working a lot through through those through those partners uh, we also have partnerships with ENY and then completed the creative destruction labs program which also provided us with some um, with some exposure um, how are we leveraging blockchain? Uh, yeah, so we use blockchain uh, very specifically uh, for uh, helping us execute our, our transactions. So um, blockchain is, uh, enables us to execute our carbon credit transactions. We actually use it as an audit trail, um, primarily to make sure that all the parties associated with that transaction have um, are clear on what has actually happened, what has been executed and generated. Um, it is production ready and it is being used in Alberta. And uh, we built our own, it is uh, a Hyperledger Fabric backend. And then we've customized it and um, turned it into our own thing. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. I'm happy to do a demo. We can actually walk people through it for whoever's interested. Oh yeah, that would be very cool. Thank you, Pajit. Thanks for your time. Uh, next we have Sandra from 10 Power. Hi everyone. Great to connect. Can you see my screen? Yep. Great. Awesome. Since I'm the last presentation, let's do the fastest meditation in the world. Everybody breathe in and smile. We're gonna breathe out and say yes. Yes! Can y'all do that with me? <laughs> it's good for your health. Cool, my company's called 10 Power. And what 10 Power is doing is bringing renewable energy to people around the world who lack access to electricity. Imagine going through the pandemic right now without access to electricity or running water. There are regions across the world suffering from energy poverty. This is a map of places on the planet that have high rates of percentages of the population that don't have access to electricity. The darker the red, the more intense the energy poverty. Now what's interesting about this map is that when you overlay solar generation potential, the places suffering from the most acute energy poverty actually get the most sun. So it's a massive business opportunity to the tune of 12 billion globally. Our company is currently focused on Haiti, which is the only red dot in the Americas here. Now, not only is Haiti highly susceptible to energy poverty, they're also on the front lines of COVID right now with um, cases increasing exponentially. Now, similar to what Marcus talked about earlier this evening is um, the curse of diesel generators. So in places that have a lack of access to a grid, almost all business owners are using dirty diesel generators, which are incredibly expensive and also create toxic emissions that contribute to climate change. In Haiti, there's a similar situation to many places across the planet that lack access to electricity. There's one utility monopoly called EDH that provides highly unreliable power um, so there are frequent blackouts ranging from days to weeks at a time. 70% of the population does not have access to the grid 
And it's very difficult for small business owners to get access to the type of capital that they need that's suitable for financing solar. So basically the only people who can afford solar are people who can take all of that working capital out of their operations to finance solar up front. Now energy is the most fundamental building block for every single other aspect of livelihood improvement, ranging from clean water to healthcare services, all the way up the ladder to global commerce and access to education and job markets. 10 Power's business model is threefold. We provide project development, so we bring in international quality engineering according to international codes and standards. We also source finance for projects to make sure that our customers can afford solar month over month at a price that's equal to or less than what they're currently spending on their diesel generators. And our third prong is local partnerships. So we work with local solar installers with a gender empowerment lens to help build capacity within the marketplace and build green economies in these places that are on the front lines of climate change. Our revenues come from two streams. One is from project developer fees. So we have a markup on the price of equipment and installation. And the second is from interest on the solar loans of which we return a portion to our investors and reinvest a portion in future solar loans. Our first project was on UNICEF Haiti's headquarters. This project um, was close to 700K and um, gross income for 10 power was close to 250K. Cumulative savings that UNICEF will impact over a 25 year lifespan of the panels is 3.3 million. And the social impact every year for UNICEF is serving for over 299,000 children. The environmental benefit of this project will be close to 6 million tons of carbon dioxide reduction in the atmosphere, equivalent to over 70,000 trees being planted for 10 years. This project on UNICEF Haiti's headquarters was actually the largest solar installation on any UNICEF base in the entire world. We worked in their three main office buildings that are their Port-au-Prince headquarters of Haiti, out of which they base all of their Haitian operations. With this program, we also launched our Women's Solar Installer Training Program in partnership with Haiti Tech University. UNICEF was excited about this because 10 Power is addressing multiple UN Sustainable Development Goals. Number one, no poverty. Number seven, renewable energy access for all. And number 13, climate action now. We're focused on building capacity in the Haitian market with our teams of Haitian solar installers. And we have a gender empowerment lens, bringing women solar installers on site for every single installation that we're doing and helping to train off gender parity in the workforce. This next project we just finished over the last couple of weeks. This is a solar water desalination plant. This project was conducted in conjunction with Give Power, which is Solar City and Tesla's nonprofit. So this project had um, a little bit thinner margins as we were working with them. Um, a pretty, pretty tight um, NGO here. So our install price was 258K. Um, gross income for 10 power was 16K. And, um, and it came from a grant from World Hope International. We um, finished this project under COVID. So I'm um, so really grateful that the team was able to get out there to this island off the coast of Haiti on Laguna. And the social impact as a result from this project is clean drinking water for up to 40,000 people that is now flowing. We have a number of projects in our pipeline and we are currently focused on healthcare facilities. One of our Keystone projects right now in our pipeline that we're currently raising capital for is Jeskew Hospital, which has been in operation since 1983 in Haiti with consistent funding. And they are now the main COVID-19 response center for all of Haiti. We also have a children's hospital called Rebecca Friedman Children's Hospital that specializes in cardiovascular surgery for children. But of course, all healthcare facilities right now in Haiti are being repurposed for COVID response another community-based hospital that is um, located in a beautiful beachside community called Jacques Mel that, um, that provides um, a variety of services um, focused on women's health and eye health. We have a rock star team distributed between the United States and Haiti. Um, myself, I was previously at AutoGrid, um, which was a big data for the smart grid company, helped them raise close to 14 million Series B, and AutoGrid now has international global partnerships and manages over two gigawatts. Jeff Clearwater is our senior solar engineer. He's founded five solar companies with two exits, and he's been in solar basically since the birth of the industry in the 1970s. On the ground in Haiti, we have Leslie Taird, who's a, our lead solar engineer who put solar on the US Embassy in Haiti. Daphne Vertus, who worked with Total Energy, an international energy company, and helped USAID implement a microgrid in the north of Haiti. She oversaw all linesman's operations there. Chris Stern is our US-based finance expert who also has a background as a solar installer. And Christian Chibier has worked in construction and, um, and he has contacts all over the country 
Um, and he, he has the, that great combination of technical skills as well as biz dev skills. We're building a replicable model that we can take to other markets. Haiti is one of the most difficult places on the entire planet to do business. So one of our mottos is if we can do it in Haiti, we can do it anywhere. We've definitely accomplished a lot with very little in Haiti. 10 Powers, I'm grateful to be part of the United Nations Foundation Energy Access Practitioner Network, as well as a variety of other um, organizations. We've received some accolades and recognitions. And we are currently raising 2 million equity in a blended capital stack. So to date, we have raised $812,000, um, including 525 in SAFE agreements, 207K in debt, um, 80K in fellowship and grants. And alongside this fund, but separate from it, we've actually launched a donor advised fund. So even though we are a for-profit B Corp, we have created a philanthropic interest um, instrument so that people can put philanthropic capital, receive tax credits, for donating to the 501c3 in which this is housed. And that capital will go towards underwriting our solar loans with more risky investments for Haitian small to medium businesses that are not backed by international NGOs. So if you happen to have a DAF, you can transfer it over into our DAF. And we're also using this as a security to underwrite investments and in equity in our organization. Thanks so much. And I know I went pretty fast with that. So I really welcome any questions if y'all wanna dive deeper into any of these topics that we covered. Valentina has a question. Uh, yeah, Sandra, thank you so much for the presentation. I really liked it. I think my question is more the sense I'm getting is it's very project based. So I'm just wondering, kind of in the long run, do you see this as more you discover an area, then you develop a project to help it? Or just me, I'm just like curious, how do you ex like, um, prepare to expand your models. Sure thing. Yeah, so what we're basically building our ecosystems. So Haiti is the first ecosystem that we're developing. And, um, and what we're, we're putting together right now is, um, is basically a formula for us to be able to go to markets with high energy poverty that have a ton of sun, but for all of the reasons that we mentioned, lack of access to capital, um, lack of capacity within the market, um, do not have a thriving solar market. So, um, so we have all of the, the basic formulas for building out a team for the training modules, for figuring out how to put together the capital stack. And currently in Haiti, we actually have close to 100 million in interested customers right now. So, so basically, um, businesses that are running diesel generators that have roof space. And, um, and we can either offset or with energy storage, um, significantly reduce their dependence on diesel generators. And, um, and we are training our Haiti team to take over more and more of the responsibilities. Um, so the US core operations will remain very agile and light as we scale into new markets, we'll be able to replicate this process again and again. So, um, so with these projects, we've gotten um, a pretty significant amount of traction in the market and, um, and we're definitely looking towards an ecosystem approach that's replicable in other places. Thank you. Um, just a quick follow up, like, because I feel like it sounds like you're doing so much good, kind of like helping the local economic development. Are you going to get any help from the government and form like a maybe PPP kind of thing to like, I don't know, in terms of also raising capital? Yeah, in Haiti, that's a pretty far cry right now. Our, um, what we're working on in terms of um, institutional financing is international development banks. So after this round, um, will be big enough to where we can start attracting capital from entities like the World Bank and the IFC. And, um, and so there are a number of programs that, that are um, in place for, for Haiti, um, for the Caribbean region, and also for climate finance. And, um, and so that'll be our next step is, is starting to leverage um, institutional partnerships with development banks, um, which will involve the Haitian government as well. And um, we've been involved in a number of conversations with the World Bank and the Haitian government in, um, in structuring those types of capital deals. Um, I see a question from Roxy. What's the projected revenue breakdown between project developer fees and financing fees? So, um, so we right now have um, about a 30% markup on, um, on, our, on most projects as project developer fees. And, um, and in terms of financing, it, it varies um, right now. The interest rate varies on the credit of the customer. Um, so it's usually between um, 7 to 15% in terms of finance. Um, and, and we're also looking at what they're currently spending on diesel generators. 
um, to make sure that we can meet or beat the price that they're um, currently expending on energy. Um, in terms of partnerships for solar financing, we to date have taken on investments from individual impact investors, um, in addition to a couple of impact funds. And, um, and we are in conversation with a number of solar crowd financing platforms currently. Um, and as I mentioned, also some um, international development banks. Um, the people in Haiti view our projects as highly beneficial. So, um, so we're getting a ton of inbound leads um, as we started doing some press on our existing projects. And, um, and we hear frequently from communities who are, are saying, you know, please, can you help us get water and power in our communities? There are also a number of um, community-based projects that are supported by the diaspora community um, of Haitians living in the US or abroad um, that have um, deep community relationships and some access to capital and who are really looking for that on the ground expertise so that it's not, um, you know, an external organization coming in and dropping some solar panels and then leaving but rather a company that has a strong local presence so that if anything goes wrong, there's a local number to call and people can be there immediately to, um, to do operations and maintenance regularly on the sites. Great, thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you. Uh, next we have Pika. Yes, hi everyone. My name is Alon, it's a second. Um, all right, yes. So hi everyone, my name is Alon, and I can, I'm the founder of, of Pika. Uh, you can see me here with uh, my baby daughter Raz. Um, so, as, so as a new parent, it was very exciting to, to start uh, uh, this new uh, period or like of my, like of my life. Uh, it was a, a very exciting times. And we also started to use diapers. <laughs> the diapers are very, very like, uh, like, very, very, like very, very expensive. Um, you can see it, it costs about from 50 to $100 like per month. Um, uh, and on the other end, you have reusable diapers, also called cloth diapers. That, that, that you just need to buy between 20 to 30 diapers and then um, just uh, clean, clean them with the, with the washing machine. But they are very, very hard to handle. Lots of parents like go to, go to the cloth diaper shop and just hear about all the cleaning process and it's, they just run out <laughs> from all the, from like uh, here, like all this, uh, all this, um, all this work. And on the other end, you have the environmental pollution. Like each baby is using around six and a half thousand diapers. Um, they are about like, like between 2.5 to 5 percent of the of the waste in landfills. It's basically like all like, uh, um, uh, like made from from, pla from plastic. And you have like the the cloth diaper that that you just need to only um, uh, the only the only waste it is, it is water and detergent. So Pika, it's basically a, a small mm -hmm. machine that cleans and dries reusable diapers without mm -hmm. doing anything, just put inside the, just put inside the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the soil diapers and just in, a, in one click and, and in two hours, the, the parent will have a, a, a ready to clean diaper. It can clean between one to 10 diapers. It is very simple to set up, connecting with, to, to the water mm -hmm. and drain connection. Um, it can it can clean also other the um, products like like one size and bulk flows. It is basically cheaper and uh, much more aligned with the current uh, parents want to to use much more eco friendly products. And it, it, it and it is it is the first time that parents that want to use cloth diapers um, that, that that she can have a one hundred percent sanitized diaper in their home. So, so, so if you look on, like on the, 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 ecological, the, ecological, the ecological, the ecological comparison, you can see that it, it is like a, like a much more uh, better product. Uh, if you look on, on, on the on the on the plastic waste and genus gas that, that we uh, provide, um, the, mo the the market is, it is it is basically six sixty billion dollar market. Uh, currently, in the States, 5% uh, of the parents are using cloth diapers, but we are going to, to, to change that. We're also going to tackle the, like, in, in nursery homes, bringing, like, Pika to, uh, 
to adults. We, in the machine can, can also clean baby wipes and also uh, reusable menstrual pads. Um, currently, we have uh, a working prototype. We filed patents. We, de we developed a, a capsule that worked together with, with the machine. Uh, and we did, all, uh, did this uh, successful pilot here in, here in Israel. Um, and like we're going like now to uh, develop the full working machine uh, and, and then have like a much bigger pilot and uh, like doing like more uh, uh, developing the, the brand. Uh, we have like two business models. Like the first one is selling a package of the machine, diapers and capsules for a fixed monthly price for, 40, for $45. And the other model is just a, uh, just like the Nespresso model, it's selling the machine in a cost price, and then the money will come from the capsules and diapers. Um, uh, like both of, of those models like are much better than the, the, uh, the comparators that we see here in the diaper services offer to give you like, like fresh new diapers like every week and then come and, like, and pick from you the soil diapers. And it, like, like those services like, like are like very expensive and they work like only locally. And, and like you also need to have a pile of, of, of shit in, in us for, uh, for, like for one week. Um, both of those, the models are the, like we would have, like have about a 45% uh, gross margin. Uh, like, like if in like, it, like only, like only like, like 1% of the parents, like we will use Pika, uh, in five years we will have a 200 million dollar revenue. Uh, okay, so this is a team, it's basically me <laughs> um, and uh, Moti. Uh, like my experience, it, it's mainly with venture capital and hedge funds. Uh, administration. Moti, my, my genius founder, is basically dealing with lots of hardware and soft, software products, uh, working with Google and other universities. Itzhak, he has been mainly, um, like, like he, he, he has lots, uh, lots of experience with in diversity. Gilad's developed lots of hardware products. Lee, she's basically uh, founded um, the, the clothes lab industry here. Like here in Israel, and Mittal, she led Haggis in uh, in Kiberi Clark. Uh, we're currently raising five hundred thousand dollars with the safe, so we can have the uh, fully built uh, machine, um, and then we we will go for like for another round to raise, uh, so we can go to market. Um, uh, yeah, and that's it. This is uh, my dad Raz, and uh, that is basically. So done. How do you remove the waste as the kid gets older? Okay, so it's basically it's all washed out. It's all dissolving like it, together with our proprietary capsules. So it's all everything just uh, dissolving and washed out and sanitized. So it's it's all about this uh, specific procedure procedure that we have. Um, so it's uh, just it, it just like all like all dissolving and then sanitized and like washed out. So the diaper it gets fully cleaned like at the end. Uh, your cell channel. We are currently like look, um, looking to sell directly, so we can have full control like on the on the cell uh, the cell um, the sales um, from. Uh, so it's basically selling directly to with our uh, website and then calibrate with other uh, uh, with like with bloggers with other um, uh, strategic partners that might help us that, that, might, that might help us with the sales and um, like, like then I like go to to sell with uh, with retailers and uh, so they, they can uh, show our like our, like our product with like, like in the stores more, and with with hospitals and like other places. 
Great. Thank you so much, Juan. Thank you, Sachi. Um, bye, and bye. bye. Thank you. And finally, we have Ray from Lutec. Ray, I think you're muted. Hi, this is uh, Ray from Lutec. And um, I'd like to talk about a profitable solution for methane reduction. And um, currently there are five trillion uh, cubic feet of natural gas that is flared annually, which amounts to 25% of the total gas consumption in the United States. For the flared gas, currently no major players manage to convert such an environmental and regulatory burden to significant value instead. Uh, but we do. The concept is like gold mining, but for Bitcoin. Our turnkey solution converts gas to cash by letting energy producers sell their excess energy, including flared gas, online. So we have been covered by, by energy media, for example, Daily Oil Bulletin, and also Yahoo Finance, and we have won our second runner-up in the Columbia Asia Tech Entrepreneurship Competition. Um, so Lutech was founded by Ben and myself. I have an academic background in chemical engineering and MBA, and also work experience in leading the corporate finance team in a listed company, and also investment banking at Credit Suisse. Ben has been operating data centers for blockchain applications for over five years. And we have presented our solution in conferences globally, and we were invited to present at Sarah Week in their Innovation Agora Forum as well. Um, Lutech helps to uh, capitalize on flared gas and excess energy capacity. Some countries have legislation against gas flaring, as methane is one of the worst greenhouse gases. Mm. Flaring is a common option for treating the, the gas that is not environmentally friendly, but other options would incur additional costs. Mm. So we proposed to convert gas to cash. To capitalize on the excess gas in the new data economy, we help to provide an additional revenue source that is independent of energy prices with a global market instead of in reliance on local consumption or export mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of infrastructure required. Mm -hmm. Our on-site turnkey data centers conduct high performance mm -hmm. computing, such as cloud computing and also blockchain applications. Mm -hmm. For our gas fueled solution, we would deliver returns being up to 10 times greater than the Henry Hub price. To capitalize on flared gas and also other excess mm -hmm. energy opportunities. Our solution can provide a net uh, internal rate of return of around 50% expected, and also net profit of uh, 100% in three years. Uh, it is a profitable way to reduce methane, and we do have an experienced team in providing uh, Bitcoin mining as a service already for five years. And uh, there are also derivatives for hedging the Bitcoin uh, volatility fluctuation, just like commodities. So what is Bitcoin mining? Bitcoin is created through the Bitcoin mining process where the miners um, earn the rewards in Bitcoin for processing Bitcoin transactions with our data centers. So a significant amount of energy is required for conducting uh, such a process to use such processing power. Uh, and that also results in scalable profitability as well. So to walk you through a case study of a stranded gas uh, well, the extraction and processing cost is around 80 cents per energy unit. And it was sold at 80 cents as well in the market. Mm -hmm. But including all the transportation and transmission costs as well, they're operating as, at a loss for the energy producers. Mm -hmm. So if they uh, conduct Bitcoin mining uh, with those natural gas, they would earn $20 for the same energy unit net. Mm -hmm. So look at last September, for the most of the month, they were operating at a loss. Mm -hmm. So let me walk you through the gas to cash process. Mm -hmm. So the gas is captured and filtered to run through our containerized uh, mm -hmm. gas generators. And our turnkey data centers mm -hmm. would be used for Bitcoin mining and the clients would receive in US dollars or Bitcoin if they want. So here are some of the pictures of our data centers with the power generation and also without power generation. 
And financing can also be provided by third party, just like energy equipments, to yield higher profitability. To highlight our experience in, in Bitcoin mining as a service, so we have served investment managers, including in, in the energy industry, and also family offices, and also high net worth individuals. So this is a sample term sheet we provide to the client. So I just want to highlight that the revenue, we have a revenue sharing model to show, so that our interests are aligned with the clients. So I'm, I'm currently looking for partnerships and investments and happy to talk further about a solution as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. You have a question from Edward. Number one. Um, I think some people are concerned about like Bitcoin, the Bitcoin price volatility. They are not comfortable with, with uh, this new asset class. But as I talk about, there are derivatives available, just like the options. And there are futures traded uh, in regulated exchanges operated by New York Stock Exchange uh, currently. So uh, the price is actually hedged, uh, just like commodities. Uh, we have we have sold a couple units so far. Um, is it Gene? Yeah, that's the Gene Gene's question. But for we have five years of uh, Bitcoin mining as a service. So uh, for those around ten clients that over ten clients we have, I think the average contract size would be around three hundred k three hundred thousand per contract. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you. And that was our final presentation. So please just make sure to turn in your Google Forms so we can get your interest in which companies you thought um, you would like us to continue with. And um, I'll turn it over to Jane if she has any final remarks. Yeah, uh, I just want to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, I know we're ex extremely running over time, so we'll try to confine the field day more uh, in uh, more chunk time slot for our next one. Uh, so yeah, so for investors, please submit your Google form. Um, and uh, for all the companies, uh, if we do uh, do uh, the diligence, uh, and we'll let you know if we decide to move forward with a formal syndicate uh, in about a month. Uh, but there are some companies on a more, much shorter timeline. Uh, we'll also accommodate their needs and see if it's possible to uh, have the turn run faster. Uh, and again, thank you all for participating. And if you're interested in uh, being a, uh, potentially a part of our team, uh, also let us know and join our Slack group and then you can select us uh, directly. Uh, I just want to say thank you. Uh, have a nice day. Okay, that's all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night.